Aloha and welcome to Truth in Movies. Today, we're breaking down a huge series, a uh, three-body problem. Something that's really popular in uh, different communities right now, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be talking about this one in the same way that they talked about Leave the World Behind. And uh, here on my channel, I have taken the time to uh, take some screenshots, shots, some clips, and we're going to go through the entire first season in an in-depth decode of this esoteric and strange uh, presentation by Netflix called Three Body Problem. Um, basically, it's an apocalyptic movie, so it's right up my alley. And it's all about these aliens from another world that go through their own versions of apocalypses, but it really correlates and reflects our very own world our apocalyptic cycles that we go through. So we're going to make those connections all throughout this presentation. Sit back, relax, grab a drink, some popcorn. Um, if you're in the chat, in the live stream, uh, feel free to chime in and uh, make some friends and talk about your theories and ideas. All right, let's jump into things now. First, we've got this right here. Netflix has a new intro for the actual series where they feature these three orbs, these three balls, which I've talked about a couple times here on my channel. Um, they're something that I believe is actually seen in the sky. We're going to come back to these uh, a couple of times in the presentation today, but these are essential. In the show, they say that they're three suns. We have... Um, objects, I'll say, up in our sky, up in uh, the heavens above us. I have more of an older cosmology, and I believe that cosmology plays a huge part in this movie as they're explaining it to us and basically begging the viewer to try and figure out these apocalyptic cycles, dropping us some pretty serious clues. You'll also notice the same exact three balls, these three lights, are the dead lights that we broke down uh, from the movie that we broke down called It, Stephen King's It. And this is something that we see. This is like you're looking up in the sky during our apocalyptic event where we see these three objects up there. Uh, we're also going to relate this to the Indian, um, the native, or the, yes, the Indian tale um, within Hinduism of Tripura, which I've also done a video on. But these are interesting, these three different objects. Right now we have two main lum luminaries up there in the sky, the sun, the moon. But as many of you know who are watching this live stream right now, there is an eclipse coming up. And some of us speculate there is a hidden object, a hidden orb, a hidden circle something else that's up there along with the sun and the moon and that's going to play a part so the movie starts off we go back into china about 50 or 60 years ago and they have they have rallied up all of these scientists um people especially that push mainstream academics and they're they're basically getting them and making making fun of them insulting them torturing them they put this guy who was a professor, they put this dunce cap on him. Remember we talked about the dunce cap? The dunce cap originally meant, uh, was meant for intelligent people. Intelligent people wore these types of, of hats, these conical hats, if you will, from the Phrygian cap to wizard caps and witches, um, all these different types of pointed hats indicated that a person was an intellectual. But after a time, they started putting it on students, hoping that the student would, it would somehow impart some magical form of intelligence to the student. It wasn't, it wasn't done initially to point out the student and to call them stupid or anything. It was actually an honor to wear this hat. So they would put it on the students in hopes that it would impart some intelligence to them. But over time, it became seen as the dunce cap. This guy says, aren't you a professor of physics? So they're rounding up these professors. He says, in your physics course, did you teach the theory of relativity? So now the theory of relativity as uh, brought forth by Einstein is in question. The movie is questioning the theory of relativity at this particular juncture, right? This girl says, Einstein went to the American imperialists and he helped them to build the atomic bomb. Now keep that in mind, because the atomic bomb and 
how these bombs are used in our um, space force and military and possibly even fighting against quote-unquote extraterrestrials is going to come into play later on towards the end. Um, so th they're not in favor of mainstream academics as it's been taught. They bring in his wife, and his wife says, You lectured on the counter-revolutionary Big Bang Theory. So now the Big Bang is in question. I like this so far. I'm all for I'm all for this. This is great for me so far. I know they're portraying China as, you know, people that are intolerant of academics and stuff. It's very interesting how this is starting off. So the guy responds and says, It is the most plausible explanation for the origin of the universe. Well, for him, it may be. To others out there, it may be. But, like I said, if you have more of an ancient concept, if you follow the old ways, we find that there's interesting stories that correlate to one another across countries and across time about the creation and the origin of our world and reality. The theory claims to know when time began, they say. What came before time, they ask him. Right? So what came before time? Now, I want to actually answer that question. So I like to look at time. Uh, some of you might remember DVDs or records or things like that, right? Or even a movie that you put into the VCR. All of time for those characters on, on the, in the song or in the movie, right? That's time to them is on their disc where they live in the DVD or whatnot, right? They're, they have no concept of outside of that time, of the movie's beginning and the movie's end. That's their timeline. That's time for them, right? So when did that time begin or end when that DVD was created, basically, right? So we're going to talk a lot about physics and other dimensions and things too. She says, are you suggesting God exists? Now, my own personal view on this is I like the, uh, the Hindu version of the creation of all things, which is when there were these three different gods, just like there are these three different balls or three bodies. One of those gods was Brahma. Brahma was the creator god, and Brahma was all there was at the beginning, according to the Hindu legends. So in order to create anything, Brahma had to trick himself into thinking that, um, that there was something more than him. And when he did that, he separated into two. And then he had to cast a spell on the other one so that he didn't realize that they were both actually one. Each Brahma kept separating over and over and over again, dividing and dividing and dividing, forgetting its origins, forgetting Brahma that all of them were not separate, forgetting that they were all actually one and connected, and that this separation was a veil, that it was an illusion. He says, science has given no evidence either way. So science cannot prove God exists and it can't prove God doesn't exist. So they have the crowds coming in down with academic authorities. I'm cheering at this point in the movie. I'm like, yes. Now I try to be balanced. Okay. I like to be balanced either way. Um, but this is the setup in the movie down with academics there's there's a problem with academics is what i'm getting from the movie there's a problem with what is being taught as quote unquote fact and empirical and undeniable simply because there is a majority who all agree on it and the only reason th that they're a majority is because they all report to and listen to and are approved by a few who tell the story so, they basically beat the crap out of the professor, um, you know, messing him up pretty bad and whatnot, because he's been teaching these uh, false academic principles, according to the movie. So, they beat him down, and that brings us to the introduction. Now, in the intro, let's take a look at this. Now, first, we see this right here, right? This little image. There's a dot in the middle, there's another circle outside of it, and then there's a third circle outside of that. This, this is sort of reminiscent of Atlantis, but it's going to come into play whenever we talk about the doom shape, which I bring up on my channel quite often. It's the, it's the shape that is seen in the sky whenever the apocalypse comes. So they zoom out, and they keep zooming out, and basically what you're seeing is what looks like um, other worlds and other places through an electron microscope if we were to continue to zoom out. Now this is really interesting too. As they're zooming out, this part looks like a beehive, right? Which is um, one of the symbols that the Illuminati and uh, Freemasons and whatnot 
specifically Freemasons, what they one of their symbols that they use to represent uh, quote unquote space or what I call the fractal verse. This is probably, in my opinion, more what space actually looks like being full and full uh, the fullness instead of the emptiness, the exact opposite of what mo modern academics teaches us is that space and all of the worlds out there are so far away that that you can never hope to meet other other beings or other creatures or anything and that it's dark although it's lit up by all of these lights all over the place it doesn't make sense to me so i see it being more full they continue to zoom out and zoom out and you can see that there's these pillars and structures that are holding these things together. And this is basically what I consider to be the fractal verse. This is another world in and of itself. And they can continue, we could zoom right back in. And, you know, if we continue to zoom, we'll see more people. These are dimensions. The word dimension um, basically means um, how big something is, its shape, etc. Not, not so much. I mean, I, I know it's in, in the modern age, dimension has turned into some ghostly, otherworldly, invisible plane of existence that doesn't really exist on our own. In the fractal verse, there are many dimensions. We are a part of a much bigger, larger one. And if you looked at it in that aspect, we are extremely tiny and microscopic. However, we also could zoom into our very own bodies that contain universes within us. And that there's life inside of us and that there are beings, you know, um, down within us on the microscopic level, just like we are, or as they say, as above, so below. They continue to zoom out and you start to see all these little parts of the body and these fibers and stuff. They zoom out more and you can see a head or the shape of a head. And there's two bodies right here. There's a male and a female, and they're holding each other. They zoom out even further, and you see these two bodies were inside of a building. They zoom out even further, and you see that the building is in this city structure, and it almost starts to look like some sort of a microchip or something. But this is perspective. The more we zoom in, the more intimate it becomes. The more we zoom out, the more we see the bigger picture. That this, what we're looking at, this huge city and this state and whatever they're showing us, whatever part of the world that we live on, um, is actually microscopic in nature. It all depends on your perspective. If you're zoomed in and you're looking at it, or if you're zoomed out, or if you're just living on the mesocosm and this is your world and everything is normal. They, zoom, they continue to zoom out and they show you uh, the modern academic version of the earth and they continue to zoom out and zoom out. And this has been shown to us in movie after movie after movie, showing how tiny we can actually be if we were to consider the greater, grander picture of all things. However, if, we, if, we, if we're balanced in the way that we approach all of reality, we'll see that it's all still connected, just like Brahma, whenever Brahma split itself over and over and over. All of this uh, distance, or perceived distance, as it, and that, you can see the Milky Way right there. This is basically also the crack in the dome or the firmament in the sky, but they continue to zoom out and zoom out and zoom out even further until they're just super far away. But in reality, all of these things are connected. This is the playground of life. This is Brahma's playground, I'll say, uh, or God's playground, however you like to see it. So they continue to zoom out until they start to show you the three bodies that all line up. And this, uh, the three bodies that line up in the movie, they're three sons. Okay, and that's been shown to us time and time again. It's going to play a huge part in this presentation when we have what's known as a syzygy or an eclipsing of three circular bodies up in the sky, and that always brings in the apocalypse. Uh, remember when we broke down uh, Pitch Black, right? Pitch Black had a great example of it as well, and that takes us to three body problem. Now, here's another example of how these, these same exact three bodies are shown to us in alchemical symbols and other places as well. For example, you'll see those same three balls. Um, hanging outside of the shops of, uh, what are those shops called when you go in and they, you trade stuff with them or whatever, and they always rip you off. <laughs> I forgot what that's called, but it's, it's, it's the sign of the merchants, right? Or the traders, which could also be interpreted as traitors, right? Because this is what you see when, when you're at the center of the earth, looking upwards into the sky, you see these three bodies and they show us, uh, 
these ones as well. You can see them up here in the corner, surrounded by an opening in the sky. Or some people would say that that's another sun. It depends on your interpretation, right? Or you can see it again here in ancient alchemical symbolism, where they have the dragon, they have the crescent moon, which is also sometimes seen as the horns of a bull or a goat or a ram, and then the three balls encircled by something up in the sky that emits light. That's the doom shape. Uh, sometimes it's seen as this, as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit icon, right? With the three different balls, and then God is in the middle. Uh, here's another one in alchemical symbolism. You can see here, I'll try to get it so we can bring it into the picture. So it's represented by these three heads that are up in the sky. And if we zoom out, you can see it's always encircled by something else that's up there up there in the sky. There's another circle right there. Now, in this picture, there's something growing up and touching those. This is basically the tree of life in symbolism, and it produces the elixir of life. Uh, you can also see the three ball symbolism in the flux capacitor, right, from Back to the Future. So we've got one, one, two, and then a third one down here, and right where they meet in the middle would be God, or would be energy, etc. Now, here's another one, right? This is iconic. This is classic from uh, the Dark Crystal, the original Dark Crystal movie, where they have an apocalyptic event that happens whenever they open up a hole in their temple, or uh, they, they, they open up, they, they have like an opening, this triangle in the temple, and it creates the all-seeing eye up there in the sky. And this is, um, this is that syzygy that we were referring to earlier. You'll have one large circle, then you'll have another circle on, inside of that, and then a tiny circle in the middle. These, I believe, are not Nibiru and Mars and Venus or however people have interpreted it. I've heard some really good theories, and I like all of them. Uh, you can also see the sort of flux capacitor deal going on here too. But what these are, I believe, are domes. That they are inverted domes up there in the sky, or at least um, they, they switch positions basically. But we have our firmament above us, which is traditionally a dome shape. But at the top of that firmament, it inverts and it goes inward, creating this all-seeing eye up in the sky, which is going to play a part in, uh, in uh, the episode later on. Here's another one. I took a picture of pitch black, where you can see they had these three suns or three bodies that lined up, bringing about... Uh, basically, they had their, their days of darkness, and that's what happens whenever our three bodies line up at the North Pole uh, before the apocalypse. It brings upon the days of darkness, and there will be traditionally three days of darkness. That's also whenever the portals of our world open up below and above, and otherworldly creatures, bipedal, animalistic, uh, insectoid and otherwise when they can come into our world. That's when the doors open. That's when we can and will be quote unquote invaded. You know, they're really visitors. I don't know how many of them purposefully flood into our world and how many of them are just sort of eject, you know, injected into our world or put here because of the, uh, the pressure differential between uh, our world and the worlds below and above us. Now, they start off and they, they say that they have found these professors. Now we're going to the modern day. This one professor studied cosmology, theoretical phy uh, physics at MIT. He turns on the flashlight and you can see that there's this strange code that this guy who, this guy who offed himself, right, uh, this physics professor, he wrote this strange code, this numbers that he was seeing um, in blood on the wall over and over and over. This is a countdown. He says it's a strange suicide note. Another countdown, he says. So now we have some sort of a countdown. We know it's an apocalyptic movie because I've told you that ahead of time. And now we have countdowns. I have found that the movies time and time again are basically screaming from the rooftops that the apocalypse is on the way. And, the, and that they're showing us, uh, they're talking all about it, showing us ways to survive, showing us how it's going to happen, show us, showing us what to look for, and the omens. This is the uh, investigator who's holding the flashlight. He's one of the main characters in the show, and he's uh, basically acts as a type of watcher, somebody who's... Uh, who's watching these physicists. We'll meet all the different physicists and stuff. So now we go to Oxford University's particle accelerator. Particle accelerators play a huge part in this as well. They're always circular as you see here. And it's interesting to me that humanity is using these particle accelerators to, to make circles. 
You know what I mean? But when they show this, uh, there's sort of a futuristic particle accelerator that these aliens have. It looks exactly like this, except for they shoot the energy towards the center. And it all meets at the center, and it works way better than, than these ones do. But all of the particle accelerators around the world are breaking. And no one knows why. All of the scientists who are looking into it, all of the math is failing and no one knows why. And it's freaking everyone out. And some people are killing themselves. Some people are um, going delirious. Some people are afraid. So we get inside of this particle accelerator where we meet one of our first characters. This guy says all of the physics of the past 60 years is wrong. That's how the movie starts. By, by having a character basically look right at us and say all of the physics of the modern age is wrong right we already started the movie by talking about einstein and academics and all of that and now we've got somebody from the modern age telling us science is broken there's something very wrong with science and uh mainstream academics and the things that we're being taught it may have worked or appeared to work for a little while but whenever whenever uh unexplained things start to happen in our world then it goes chaotic because um, academics is poor at explaining um, the esoteric or the arcane. So a woman comes in. She says, do you believe in God? And he says, no, I don't. He's a scientist, so he doesn't really believe in God. Not that all scientists don't believe in God. And she says, so what's left? So she walks out to this huge platform, looks down into this uh, pit, basically, and opens up the door and takes this leap and she jumps to her death all the way down and dies for some strange reason nobody really knows why but it has something to do with science failing and i believe it's 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 what people have relied upon for so long right we've been we've been indoctrinated for so long that whenever all of our indoctrination starts to fail and it doesn't add up especially when we see that the changes that are happening in our world like you know, all the different omens that are happening that indicate that the apocalypse is on the way. Now, these two scientists, they go to this bar. And I'm not going to get into their names that much. I know I usually break all the names down, but we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to skip their names. She says, the second law of thermodynamics, eventually everything turns to crap, basically, right? So in the second law of thermodynamics, we're speaking scientifically, everything eventually turns to crap. This is also known as the law of entropy. Physics is turning to crap. Bars can't be far behind. Now, this was a joke that they were sort of, you know, saying like that they're at a bar and, you know, there's people singing really bad and they're getting hit on by some bar flies and stuff. So they're sort of making a joke. They say physics is turning to crap. Physics is messing up. So bars can't be far behind. I thought this was really interesting. Let's check it out. The second law of thermodynamics, entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system. We live in a system. All systems gain entropy over time. That means all systems or enclosures or those things that exist within those enclosures or enclosed spaces, uh, that they break down over time. That's what entropy basically is. The second law of thermodynamics says that the total entropy of both a system and its surrounding will never decrease. Ah, but I believe that there's an exception to that. This is why there's problems with mainstream academics, why uh, problems with their teachings and whatnot, right? Because one, I don't think they have taken into account exponentially increasing entropy or breakdown, which is the age that we live in right now. And two, what if the conditions of that system change? Let me show you, right? So here it is over here. Uh, we've got the zeroth law, they say, the first law. Uh, the second law and the third law. So the one that we're looking at right now is the second law. Entropy of an isolated system always increases. Or you could just simply say hot transfers over to cold, right? Hot meaning activity and energy slows down. Everything is slowing down, right? Which means it becomes cold. So going from hot to cold. Um, here's three examples of different types of systems as we're talking about entropy or the breakdown or degradation of energy within a system. On this one over here, this one is an open system, 
as you can see portrayed by the bottle being opened. This one is a closed system. The bottle has a cap on top, and this one is an isolated system, which means it's completely isolated. Nothing can come in, nothing can come out. Our world would act as a type of isolated system, right? Um, where nothing can come in or nothing can come out, or you could see it as a closed system because we have uh, a pop top on the top of the firmament. It's closed right now, but we know if we study that the firmament has opened in times past and it will open once again. This also means that energy can come into this bottle. For example, light. Light can pass through this bottle. This is where we get our sunlight. This is where daytime comes into play. That Let's say that this bottle represents the firmament of our world, right? Um, the plasma that is on the outside of the bottle is kept out because it's physical, but the light from that plasma may pass through the glass of the bottle or the ice of the sky and add energy to this world or add heat to this world, um, which slows down its uh, entropy that it goes through. Now remember, they said when physics is turning to crap, the bars can't be far behind. So when academic starts to break down and people have an awakening, these pockets of um, alternative thinkers and truth seekers and whatnot, when physics starts to become crap and people can no longer trust the academic versions, the bars can't be far behind. Meaning the beams that shoot up out of the world, the terrestrial beams of energy, because we go through an electromagnetic reversal where energy shoots up and out of cavernous systems and volcanoes and openings within the earth. And we get these pillars of the sky, these pillars, these ancient pillars. And uh, this is where the pillar cults came from, the rod cults, the people who worshipped a beam or a staff or a stick or a tree or whatever it may have been, because these were the ancient energetic sources in, in, in the past world, and they will be in the world to come. So she says, okay, why is everyone freaking out? This girl right here has no idea, you know, why everyone's making such a big deal about stuff. And she says, about, about a month ago, all of the major accelerators, the particle accelerators, started generating results that make no sense, right? Hey, thanks for your support, everybody. I appreciate you guys. Um, that make no sense. So about a month ago, the major accelerators started generating results that don't make any sense. Uh, and then she says, well, then maybe it's a hack. Maybe somebody hacked into it, right? Maybe it's not that the math is off or the academics are off. Maybe someone hacked into it to change it. She says, in every accelerator on the planet. Um, so she asks, you know, well, what does your friend say about it? And she, and she says, he says it's impossible, that that can't happen. I love it whenever people say things are impossible, especially when the impossible she pokes its little head out. <laughs> like when the impossible actually happens, when it comes to pass, that's when people start losing their minds because they're convinced it's impossible. But I'm more like Alice from Wonderland where she says, you know, uh, they talk about impossibilities and doing seven different impossible things before breakfast, right? I don't believe in impossible. Improbable, possibly, but not impossible. She says these experiments teach us how the universe works. The, yes, so far, according to the stories that they've made up and their narratives, they're going along with that. But if their narrative is wrong, if their cosmology is wrong, if their history is wrong, then over time it will all start to break apart because they didn't have it right to begin with. It won't add up. It won't stand the test of time. And that... And then she holds out a picture of what the particle accelerator is looking like, which it's all in flux, basically. This represents our world going into flux. And not just our world, but the other worlds that surround us. There are other worlds just outside of the firmament that are nearby. Close enough so that if you could open up the sky, you would see these other huge places and realms that are just within reach. They would look like they're so close, instead of being so distant and tiny little specks in the sky. She says, this is Alice in Wonderland. And this is what we're talking about. Alice in Wonderland. Our world is about to change. It always changes. It's constantly changing. But every now and then we go through major fluctuations, major shifts, which are cataclysmic in nature. So this girl right here, uh, she starts seeing these lights, these blurry lights. And she asks this guy, can you see that? And she starts looking over at it. And he's like, what? I don't see it. She can see something that he can't. 
And she says that. She looks up and the light, she tries to make it out, becomes numbers. It's a countdown. It's like a clock that's counting all the way down to zero. So some people in this world, right? The movie's reflecting our own reality back to us. Some people in this world have a vision or a sight, or can see things that other people cannot. Maybe not always physically with your actual eyeballs, but it's comprehension. It's an understanding and a perspective. And oftentimes it goes beyond that, and it's a feeling, it's an emotion, it's a knowing, it's a deep inner standing of truths that cannot be proven, cannot be explained away. They're just innately known, intimately, deep within us. And she sees a countdown. It's a, it's the countdown basically to the apocalypse. It's also the countdown to her life ending is what they sort of infer. Um, but some people can see the countdown happening. That the, that the clock is ticking. And that the apocalypse is on the way. Now, we get back to the to the uh, investigator and he's got this whole conspiracy theory kind of cork board up in front of him of all the different uh, physicists and scientists that he's been keeping tabs on. So this is his little study room. He's trying to make sense of what's going on. And he knows it has something to do with these physicists because they keep coming up in his studies. This girl is the one that just killed herself. So he crosses her off of the list, right? And it also kind of reminds me of biblically, the Bible talks about how when the next apocalyptic cycle comes or when judgment day comes or doomsday, which also plays a part later on, that there would be people that would start committing mass suicides, that people would just get rid of themselves because the world is just so crazy, which I can understand, you know, given the current state of the world that we live in now. But people would just give up. They would see no purpose and no reason to it. And I, I get that. I understand that. Um, that's because we live in the moment. And it's difficult for us, and by us I mean myself, really. But it's difficult sometimes to see past the horizon when you've sunk down so low in that swamp of sadness. Or when people become depressed. Or when they let the worries and the problems of the, the, the current time and the things that we're going through now get to us. right? But if we hold on... We can rise above and we can, we can make it to what's coming next, which is change. So the girl get, jumps on a, a train. She looks over. She still sees this countdown everywhere she looks. Things behind it are kind of blurry. There's sort of a, an electrical sizzling uh, you know, sound that you can hear as this clock is ticking down and her time is running out. The movie is screaming at us that our time is running out. Many movies, actually, have been screaming to me that time is running out. So, uh, they go to that girl's funeral, the girl that killed herself, and she says, her, her buddy asks her, did you see the neurologist? So, she's seeing things in her field of view, and that's what an academic mindset is, to go to the expert, to go to the neurologist, instead of healing yourself, instead of studying yourself and figuring it out, she's, her friends are like, go to the neurologist. And she's like, she has no clue what's happening. She has, she has no idea why this is going on, right? So the neurologists, the experts can't figure it out. Meanwhile, the detective is taking pictures of everyone who comes out of the funeral, starts clicking all the pictures. These are the main characters, the people that are going to be seen throughout this entire series. Uh, they're all academics. They're all brilliant minds, basically, is how they're shown in the in the movie. And then he goes and follows this guy. He's a rich guy, the man in black right here. Um, all you need to know about him is he's very wealthy, he's very rich, and he's going to this personal helicopter. And he's got something to do with these aliens that we'll be introduced to here soon. Now take a look at the helicopter. His name is Evan, so the, his company's name is Evans Energy, which is EE, which... They have, these, they, they have these different codes, okay? The people in the know, these families that have passed on certain sensitive information, this apocalyptic information, basically, um, from generation to generation. They have these different codes and symbols that they use quite often. EE is 33. It's just symbolic. It's a hidden code that's in there that says, we are the survivors, or we are related to the people who are the survivors. 33 is Mount Maru which is also MM, which is also a three if you turn it sideways. Um, it's, it's, third, it's Mount Maru because Mount Maru, the giant mountain at the center of the world, 
the, the largest of these openings, um, it's a plasma volcano that erupts this huge blue beam of life-giving energy. Um, it's also the safe place as well. Um, so it's said to be 33 miles in circumference. That's where the 33 comes into play, right? That's the safe place is Mount Maru, is the trunk of Yggdrasil, the world tree. But if you take a look at this and you actually turn this sideways, let me see if I can turn this sideways for us. You see that? Let me see if I... Hold on. Let me make it a little bigger here. Now, look at this shape, right? They, they draw these things purposefully. We've got like this sort of square root symbol in the middle, right? The square root is... It would, it's sort of representative of Mount Maru, basically, the center of the world. Um, but it also looks like a squatter man symbol. It looks like a person, like a stick figure with its arms up in the air with a red head at the top. So if we take a look at some of these ancient glyphs, we find the quote unquote stick man figure, the squatter man figure, which can be looked at like this, or it can be looked at like this as well. But this is one of the main petroglyphs and cave paintings and drawings that's found the world across is this strange stick figure symbol that does not represent or seem to represent your average human being. What it is, is its energy, that terrestrial energy that shoots up towards the dome and then spreads out. Now the dome itself, that inverted eye in the sky, typically is going to be red in color because there's ionized hydrogen right behind it, which is uh, going to be a red spectrum as well. But if we look the world across, we can find many of these different squatter man glyphs. Now, sometimes the legs are down and they're facing downwards. Sometimes they're upwards. But this is that same symbol, the Evans energy. The head of the squatter man is the, uh, the depressurization point up there in the firmament. And then you've got the main beam and you've got these fluctuations that come off of it, giving you a type of Jacob's ladder, right? Uh, the 33 symbolism is ingrained in all of our pop culture and companies and major corporations um, because they're owned by the survivors. The survivors of the past apocalyptic cycle set up their own families for success so that they would be rulers and that they would be in charge and they would be wealthy and that they would not want, want for anything in the world to come that others would have to work for it just as they worked for it. And I'm not defending any of them or anything or their actions or, you know, I'm just saying that's what it represents, right? That's why we have the 33 at the Phoenix. Sometimes the Phoenix with the double head, they have turned the Phoenix into an eagle also at times, but this is a cartoonified version of that beam that shoots up and then branches out, giving you the cosmic bird or the phoenix or um, the thunder, the thunderbird, and different things like that. So, this guy, who's a rich guy, gets into his black helicopter and he takes off. We'll come back to him in a bit. So, the girl who's seeing the countdown, right? She goes out for a break. She can't handle it. She goes out and smokes on the uh, stairs. And this other girl comes and sits down next to her. And she's like, I'm not interested. Don't talk to me. And she's like, how's your countdown? So, that gets her interesting. That gets her interest. She says, how far has your countdown got? How much time do you have? It's easy to make it stop. And she's like, how do you know about the countdown, right? But the other girl says, it's easy to make the countdown stop. Put an end to your work. This girl right here works for, uh, she, she owns her own nanotechnology company. So this girl over here on the left, uh, you could see her as representing like the gods or, or whatever, um, basically saying our technology is getting out of control. And that's one of the signs and one of the omens that preceded uh, the deluge or the worldwide flood that, it's, that happened before. The gods looked down, or the Elohim, or God, looked down and said, Man, look at what mankind has accomplished. Anything that they put their minds to, they can make it happen now. That's how far their technology has come. We need to destroy them before their technology uh, gets out of control. Because what might they do then? Have they earned the right to go and traverse the fractalverse or to roam about freely in the heavens? Are they good? Do they have good energy? Or have they proven themselves to be liars and fakes and deceitful and base and terrible people in general? That's the question. And that's why the world was destroyed, according to the legends last time. So she says it's easy to make that countdown stop. If you don't want to die, if you don't want the apocalypse to come, you put an end to your work. You stop looking into nanotechnology and stuff like that. It's not to like, it's not 
you know, uh, the bad guys are trying to just halt our progress or whatever. No, like growth is good. Progress is good. But whenever the thing that's progressing is inherently evil, even if it isn't aware of it, then it's going, it's like allowing poison to spread to other worlds and other places, right? She says, no more nanofibers. You stop your work on that. You shut down the lab. It's simple. You just, you just stop all of this technology that's getting out of control because you don't know how to use it properly. You haven't proven yourselves. So tomorrow at midnight, at exactly midnight, right? Midnight is symbolic for the apocalypse, but also you go outside and you look up at the sky. Now looking up at the sky is also something that the movies have been telling us for quite some time or telling me for quite some time to pay attention to the cosmos, pay attention to uh, the stars, the firmament, the dome, the sun, the moon, comets, these things that are making their appearances as they start acting up. They flare up and they go into flux and they start changing. They become brighter and they become more focused and uh, they start changing in their positions and stuff. So go outside and look up at the sky. And then she asked, has the universe ever winked at you? Right? The whole winking is uh, why do people wink at each other? It's you're winking to let someone know things are about to change, right? Like, hey, don't worry, basically things are going to change. That's why they wink. That winking of the eye is makes a one-eye symbolism. That's also why you see the, the Freemasons and all those types of families. That's why they cover their eye or all of the singers and you know different people who are a part of that, whether they know it or not, they're covering their eye because it harkens back. It's, it's a way of saying, hey, this is what I'm from. I'm from that place up there in the sky, which is the real moon, also known as Sin, which is interesting. Um, but it's a part of the dome. It's 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 the doorway to the heavens, basically. And uh, that's the one eye in the sky. So that's why people wink to let you know things are going to change. When you see that one eye, things change. Uh, whenever you can see that eye in the sky, that means we've gone through an apocalyptic scenario and our world changes. You don't want it to get to zero, she says. Nothing good ever happens at zero. Now that eye in the sky is circular. It also is sort of uh, the zero symbolism. It's the zero point of our world. That's where creation comes into this world. That's where energies come into this world and create and recreate and change the world as, as we know it and throwing us you know, into another age, into another epic. <clears throat> so nothing good ever happens at zero. That's whenever you see a zero in the sky or a circle in the sky. And then she gives her this little decoder. It's really interesting. It says toasty oasters on it. You see that right there? Toasty oasters. Let me make that a little bigger. Now, this is like this sort of decoder that you would find in a cereal box a long time ago, like a little cereal prize. And she says, look up at the stars and he hands her a decoder. This is the, the movie's telling us to decode what you see happening in your own skies because Mother Earth is telling you when the apocalypse is coming and what to expect and the condition and the state of the world that we live in, including our own selves. Toasty O stars. So it gives her this little decode. Uh, so she, she grabs the little decoder and then we switch gears. We go back to China and this is a few years after, uh, that girl's father was killed, that, that professor. And she's sort of in this, uh, work camp and at the bottom of the work camp, uh, she looks up and you see that there's this lofty cliff face. And on top of that, there is this, uh, what do you call that? A satellite, right? Now the girl, the, the girl which is uh, the father's who died, his daughter. Uh, she's growing up and she works in this sort of slave camp doing this work. And this guy that she's talking to says, I've climbed up there. No one knows what goes on behind those gates. So this is some sort of Chinese secret facility up here on top of this mountain um, where they shoot out energies into the sky. He says, things get more odd the closer you get to the top. The soldiers working up there have lost their hair. Clear weather turns stormy and animals make strange sounds. These are also the types of things that I've come across whenever I research the anode and cathode islands up towards the North Pole or Mount Maru or that uh, that ancient island that used to be pit 
pictured on the center of our maps at the North Pole, that there was a huge circular island up there. And the closer you get, the stranger things become, right? So for example, clear weather turning stormy uh, at the exact center of the world, I would expect there, if there is a, uh, a huge opening in the earth, which is Mount Maru, I would expect there to be a pressure differential, which would create pressure systems, which is weather patterns, right? And they would change up there. Uh, so th she's sitting together with this guy and he breaks out this book and he gives the book to her. And this is one of those off limits books, banned books. And he says this book was very influential in the West and he gives it to her to read. So she starts reading it. You can see the, the title of the book here. It says Silent Spring, right? Well, I can't really zoom into it, but it's uh, the title of the book is Silent Spring. This whole book, Silent Spring, is basically about um, uh, farmers or when they're growing crops and food. You know how like they have crop dusters and they'll spray all these insecticides and pesticides and stuff all over our own food, spraying our own food with these poisons where academics would come out and say, oh, there doesn't seem to be any long-term effects or anything, but the book supposes let's continue the time let's see how this affects let's just let's just theorize and see how this would affect the ecosystem where insects eat it and then they die they become poisoned and then animals eat those insects and birds eat those insects and then other animals eat the birds and then it basically it finds its way back to us in the few in the food chain affecting humanity and we have basically been poisoning ourselves with insecticides for so long and we've become used to it and then we wonder why we're sick and why we have cancer and sicknesses and diseases and our lifespans are shrinking and stuff, right? So it's a very um, off, it's a, it's a banned book, basically. This guy comes in, he's like, is this your book? Have you lost this? How'd you get this toxic propaganda, right? So anything that would hint that humanity is poisoning itself, that it's doing wrong, that it's going in the wrong direction is going against the grain, Right? It's going against the mainstream population, which is controlled by just a few people at the top. So she gets thrown into this jail, basically, and put into isolation. They're torturing her. This is also what we talked about in that happened in the Middle Ages, right? When all of those saints and witches and people who seemed to be goodly people, minding their own business and helping and healing others, uh, that they were tortured also. Right? Because they went against the population. Boudica! Welcome, Boudica. High five. All right, so she gets tortured in this little jail cell. They take her up to the top of the mountain because they're going to have her go to work up here at the top. Now, she's very intelligent being raised by this professor, and they actually want to hire her. This guy says, we need you for your specific talents. She's very intellectual. Uh, the commission has decided to give you a chance. Rehabilitate yourself here rather than prison. This is a military base. The research here is of the highest security classification. Now, they tell everyone on this mountaintop that they're just, you know, that they're, they're studying. They have their own little story that they tell people, but we'll see in a minute what they're really doing. Now, we get back to the detective and he's he's found that some of these people who have died these scientists have these weird vr goggles these weird vr he calls them shiny bicycle helmets and he says whatever it is we can't get our hands on one and he knows that this weird vr goggle which i'll show you here in a bit has something to do with people dying or uh being crucial uh, players in this game that's happening that's leading up to the apocalypse and he wants to get one now this is his boss and he goes and talks to him and he says clarence you've been fired from scotland yard mi5 and osct that's this guy he represents like the elite of the elite right the watchers and he says i've got a knack for failing upwards this is basically just the watchers symbolism right they're supposed to watch and and things like that and then uh, we get to this girl right here. Now, this girl is paying her respects to the girl that just killed herself's mother, which is also the same girl that was back in ancient China. This is her, okay? So this is in the past, and then we fast forward into the future where her daughter killed herself, and then she visits her, which is the girl back in China. I know it's a little confusing, but she's trying to figure out why her daughter killed herself. That's the girl that jumped off of that bridge or whatever that was in the accelerator. She says, did she see, did she say anything strange to you? Did she do anything strange? Now this old woman 
is the young Chinese girl that went to go work at the top where that satellite was. Keep that in mind, right? Her daughter is the one that just killed herself. Did she say anything strange to you? Did she do anything strange? She was playing video games, she says. She remembers she was playing video games. Yes, quite a lot of video games. And then she gives her this helmet, this VR headset that she had. She's like, that's a video game? What kind of game is this? So she checks it out and she's like, can I have this? She wants to, you know, inspect it and see if it has anything to do with her death. So they're walking out and she's like, hey, is this you? So she sees a picture of her when she was younger on the wall. She's like, yes, that's my first job in another life a long time ago in China. And then it shows the picture of the girl uh, who went to, who was forced to work at this huge radio tower. Now this radio tower comes into play because they're the Chinese were trying to communicate with aliens. So they're using these satellite and there's other, other places around the world that try to do this too, uh, as a form of communication to try to reach intelligent life out there in space, which is really the dome. I'm going to come back to that. <clears throat> so, uh, we go back in time. This is her. Okay. So this is, this is her. And then we go back in time and they're showing you what happened in the past? And she says, well, what are we testing? You know, if we're testing stuff with this huge satellite and then they turn it on and they shoot out this beam, this signal to this portion of the dome that they think is going to work. And you hear all this static crackling. And all of a sudden, as they turn on this beam that's at the top of the mountains, it attracts animal life. All of these different birds start flocking to it. And as they get close, they all start dying and they start dropping down, you know, into the sky or whatever. Now, this is symbolic of the beam of energy that's building up inside of the world. When it erupts, um, or even before it erupts, I believe that there is a calling that animals and certain people who, who sense that calling all start flocking to it, which is the middle of the world, which is the magnetic North Pole, right? They all start going there because they feel a sense of urgency. They feel that they're being called to a place and they change their migratory patterns. Even humans start migrating closer and closer north. They start they start sort of edging their way northward, which if you've been paying attention to the news is happening right now. All right. So we've got this girl who uh, has the VR headset and she's going to put it on. So she wants to find out what this game is all about and how it might relate to that other girl's death and why she killed herself. So she sticks on the VR headset. The moment she puts it on and she has it on her face. There's, it doesn't look like it's anything. It just looks like a piece of plastic. But when she puts it on, the magic comes to life. And it shows you her eyes turn into one eye. And all of a sudden, she's taken into this strange video game type of a world where it says level one. And this is something that was created. This is alien technology that was created. And she's taken into a real actual place. So this isn't like a VR headset. I mean, it is that you put it on. But when you put it on, you're there. You can smell it. You can feel it. You can feel the wind on you. Like it's it's your it's like you're actually there. And then the static starts to crackle. She looks around, takes a look at her hands. One of the first things people do is they look at themselves within the simulation. They check themselves out, right? She's like, oh my God. And she starts taking a look around. You'll notice that there's a huge pyramid off in the distance, right behind her. And there's a path that goes directly to this pyramid, right? Sometimes it's a castle, sometimes it's a pyramid. This represents Mount Meru, okay? Which is also the great pyramid, the great mountain, the great tower of the world. Uh, the unfinished pyramid as well. That's the symbol for the unfinished pyramid because it's a volcano, okay? That's why it doesn't have a top, <laughs> like, that's why it's unfinished. It's just a volcano. So she sees this path that leads to this pyramid, which is symbolically Mount Meru. And then all of a sudden, the sun comes up and it rises and stops right above this pyramid, right? Blake1991. Hey, thanks, Blake. Appreciate you. So this is all inside of this video game. Now the sun starts to get really hot and extremely bright. And she looks around and she sees like this dead body off to the side or what looks like a dead body. And she screams and she takes off the helmet. And that's our little taste of this video game world, this virtual world that the aliens have created. It'll explain why we see this virtual world. So she takes it off. She's like, what the heck? What's going on here, right? Um, and then we go back. This part's pretty dark. 
This is hard to see, but... Oh, this is... Remember, she was told by that girl at midnight she needs to go and look at the stars? Well, it's hard to see right here, but there's her and her buddy have gone to this sort of castle place, um, and they're going to sit out and look at the sky at midnight. So she's sitting there, and she's like, has the universe ever winked at you? Hmm. What, what could that possibly mean, right? So here's the wink, right? The Illuminati wink, the Freemasonic wink, as we discussed. Also, the tongue sticking out is a part of it too, right? So the tongue basically represents plasma coming out of um, Kali or various gods and goddesses and stuff. Uh, the opening in the sky. So she looks up. She still sees the countdown. She takes a look and uh, she said to look at the sky at midnight and gave me this, which is that decoder. It came out of a breakfast cereal. And then her buddy says, just watch. Or she tells her buddy, just watch, let me know everything you observe, if you observe anything, right? Now remember, she's got a big light in front of her face too, so it's probably not easy for her to see. And he says, the stars are so bright tonight. So the guy sitting next to her comments about how bright the stars are. And she's like, dude, you're super high right now, because he actually was super high. And he's like, yeah, but still, they're pretty bright, right? This is the movie sharing us a truth. The stars are getting brighter. The moon is getting brighter. The sun is getting brighter. Everything up there in the heavens is getting brighter and brighter. And it's not because our technology is just advancing and so we're just lighting up the sky with street lights and cars and whatever. No, no. The heavens are actually getting brighter, which is another omen of the apocalypse. And there's good reason for why it does that. Then at midnight, they look up and they can't believe what they see. They stand up. They take a look at the sky and they see the stars up in the heavens. And suddenly, all of these super bright stars, right? Which is because the point of focus uh, becomes uh, all of all those stars are just points of focus, just like the sun or whatever. Um, but they can get brighter, just like the sun is getting brighter. And therefore, the world's getting warmer and hotter. But all these stars that are super bright in the sky suddenly start to flash. Every single one of them start blinking up in the heavens, just turning on and turning off. And this is going to throw academics for a huge loop because if those stars are millions and millions of miles away and they are what academics says they are, which they're not, they can't do this. There's no, there's no, there's, there's not a rational explanation for this, I'll say, right? And then this guy realizes it's a code. They're actually blinking this sort of morse code the code is the countdown basically so everyone in the world witnesses this all of the stars start stuttering and turning on and turning off right this is going to throw academics for a huge loop and that's the beginning of three body problem that was the actually the end of the first episode there but let me get back to these blinking stars real quick right in the bible for example if you take the bible literally and you understand that people explain things how they the best way that they could it says that something that happens at the end before the judgment day is that all of the stars fall or at least a third of them fall to the ground how is it how could it even be possible academically speaking for a third of the stars to fall to the earth it could not do that Especially if they're as large and big and hot and everything as they say they are. I mean, one, maybe, possibly, but all of those billions of stars or whatever, all crashing down into the earth, why would they even do that? Right? Um, and two, they could not. It, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's not likely according to their model, according to their story and their foundation. And remember, that's the foundation that they lay is their, their differing cosmology, which, uh, which differs from our ancient wise people of the past who had a different cosmology. And they said, those stars are nearby. They're close. They could easily fall to the earth because they're in the earth. They're underneath the firmament. You know what I mean? So that's the end of that one. Uh, oh, and then they show you this, which is the doom shape, right? Every At the beginning of every episode, they show you this. And I did a video. If you want to check it out and you want to know more about this shape up in the sky and how it's formed and stuff, I did a video called the doom shape. Okay, where we talk about this shape that was seen. And I give you historic examples. There's me uh, without the hat. Historic examples of this shape that was seen in the sky, these three bodies 
that were seen up in the sky. And I did this video before I even saw the movie. So this video, as this video, if you go back and watch it, that's me before I even saw a three body problem or it's, it's, you know, it's got nothing to do with the actual movie, but it doesn't matter because it's the same exact concept. This is ancient oblivion. This is history that has been hidden and forgotten about. So the entire world sees the stars blinking and they show you this on the on the news station It says unexplained blinking stars and everyone's freaking out. No one understands all these people are trying to come up with theories and uh, This guy's visiting that girl's mom And uh, she's like the blinking stars. Do you have a theory about what's going on with the blinking stars? And the guy with the glasses says it's BS there's no way. Uh, it never really happened. I don't believe in it. Now, this is something. This is a prophecy. In Islam, they say that the, the moon will rip in half. And it did in the past. And when this happens, the prophecy goes that people would not believe it. They would, just, they would say it's magic. That is, it's not really happening. It's just a trick of the eye or whatever, which is basically what this guy is saying too. So she says, how can that be? The world saw it happen. Right? Everyone saw this with our actual eyes actually happening. This guy's like, nah. He says, yeah, sure, everyone on Earth, but you know who didn't see it? Webb, Hubble, Chaos. None of the satellites saw it. So these alleged telescopes that are out there in space or whatever did not see the stars blinking. Now, that makes sense to me if our cosmology is different. If these satellites that they have shot way up there um, are maybe above the stars or something, right? It, it, it all depends. If you change, uh, if you change the situation, then you can change the parameters, and and you can and things can make sense, right? But none of these satellites up up in the heavens or up in the sky saw the stars blinking. So he says it was a deep fake. Something was faked, right? So we go back. Oh, this is basically people not believing it, right? And this is how bad technology is too, that anything can be faked these days. So because our technology is so out of control and we can basically fake anything, I can be faked. This channel can be faked. What you consider to be reality can actually be signals that are put into your brain, Elon Musk's chip and all of that stuff, and everything can be faked. So people start questioning what's real. And if you question that nothing is really real and that it's all fake, then life sort of can lose meaning and people just stop living. All right, so we get back to this. Uh, this, is the, this is where the girl who makes the nanotechnology works. And they're doing this experiment, which is groundbreaking, where they're going to try to uh, cut a diamond at the molecular level using this nano uh, fibers that she's created, basically which can just slice right through the molecular structure of the diamond. So they bring up this diamond in the middle. It's a synthetic diamond. That's the diamond in the middle, right? And you can see it, it's, a, uh, it's actually a box. It's a square shape. It's a, a cube right there. This, this is like a cube diamond. And then you have these four prongs off to the sides. You have another square right behind that. Now this to me is symbolic. These boxes, boxes do not have to be cubicle in, in in their shape box simply means container you can have a spherical box you can have a dome shaped box you can have any 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 shape of a box a box just means container that's where the word bus comes from as well it means container right so it could be rectangular it could be cubicle but let's say that these are not cubicle if they were circular or dome shaped, right, which is the boxes above us, which is the container of our world, which is the firmament and the dome, we see the doom shape again, right? The circles or the boxes up above. And then we also see this is a glyph that people have seen over and over across the world, especially here in the native southwestern United States, where there is the doom shape. There's a circle and a smaller circle within it. And then there are like these four lines that come out of it. This is why they call it the planet of the crossing or the Nibiru, because it actually has a cross on it. Uh, because I mean, one of the, I'll tell you one of my theories for that is it's reflecting what's directly below it, which is the Garden of Eden which has a lake right there in the middle and it's got four rivers that come right out of it and people saw this in the ancient world 
And they carried on the symbolism and, and they used it as an icon for new lands and new places that they would settle. This is the flag of uh, the state of New Mexico, where I was born, actually. Um, so that's that, kind of what that reminded me of. You can see the similarity in all of these iconic shapes and symbols that repeat themselves over and over. And they keep popping up in our pop culture and in our politics and in our, our every aspect of our lives. These shapes, these symbols keep popping up over and over, almost like little breadcrumbs that we can follow to find our way back home. So they take a look at this diamond after it's been, you know, zapped by this nanotechnology. And you can see um, she takes a pin, she walks up to it and she's going to just touch it and it will fall apart, right? So the diamond, AKA the glass, the hardest glass structure just easily breaks apart. This is symbolic. It's a subtle reference to the firmament breaking apart breaking open the sky opening up this is when the apocalypse ushers in this is when things start to change in our world and in the movie it's appropriate that they would show us this that we, they have the world changing right after this happens right after the hardest uh clear substance which is a type of rock a type of glass which is what the firmament was described as in ancient times as being made of rock right it's just a hard substance glass ice also, these are all the same thing. They're basically interchangeable. So, symbolically, the firmament breaks open. Immediately after they show you the symbolic firmament breaking open, there's a countdown. They show us again. The firmament breaks. This is all symbolical. This is a box. This is a container. This is up there in the sky. Firmament breaks. The countdown and then uh, it's a countdown to the apocalypse, basically. So she's like, nope, nope. I remember what that lady said. I don't want to die. We're shutting this down. She doesn't tell people that. But she says, I'm chief scientific officer. I'm ordering you to shut all of this down. So she, t she stops all progress on her invention and her work in nanotechnology. And she takes a look at her little clock as she goes outside. And it disappears. It worked. She, she halted the progress. This is very interesting. Why is this happening? We'll come back to that. So, meanwhile, in China, ancient, not ancient, but China 50 years ago or whatever, right? We've got that same girl, this girl right here, who has been hired to help them out in their endeavors to try to communicate with aliens using that, using that satellite. Excuse me. So, what she does is she's going to explain um, how to send a signal to the quote-unquote aliens out in space. So she draws it up here. She sort of makes a joke that she did the math for the guy who's watching, right? And here's what she says. This small circle here is Earth, right? And I'm going to simplify all of this for everybody just to save us some time. But she figured out that instead of shooting uh, a beam or a frequency or a message just at some random place at the sky or at the dome in all reality, right? If you just shoot it at the dome, it's probably just going to reflect back, right? She figures out we need to shoot it at the sun. We need to shoot this frequency at the sun because the sun will amplify that frequency and send it back out into space and it will be amplified and then the aliens will hear it. And he says, so we can use the sun as a super antenna? It's very interesting. He says, by aiming our signal at the sun, we can use it as a super antenna. So if you imagine an alternative cosmology where there's a, a dome over the world that's made of glass or something transparent that's very hard, right? You have the light that comes through that glass, which is a frequency, which is energy and waves and, and whatnot, right? They meet at a focal point that we call the sun, and then they redistribute into what we call daylight or daytime, right? And then that focal point moves about if you were to shoot a frequency at that it could it could potentially theoretically travel right up along those beams right to its point where it, where it goes onto the actual dome and hit the dome and then uh you know you could you'd have a better chance of communicating with alien life or whatever lives on the dome or on the other side of the dome etc right 
So that's kind of what I get from that. Now this guy steals her idea, takes it to the Chinese boss, and he says, you want to aim a super powerful radio beam at the sun. At the red sun. And he starts getting really pissed off because the red sun is symbolic for their leader in ancient China. Now let's talk about this. In ancient China, we have the red sun. Right? Even in Japan, they have a big red sun on their flag. Uh, the sun used to be red. The sun has gone through and is right now going through color spectrum shifts. Right now, it's going into a blue shift, which is going to bring about an apocalypse by fire, uh, a hot apocalypse. The last one was the apocalypse by water. That's the red sun. When we get into the blue sun, it's going to be an apocalypse by heat, by fire. Because that point of focus gets so small, the color spectrum shifts into the blue frequencies, and it becomes extremely hot. Okay, when this when the sun is red, it expands, it gets kind of blurry and out of focus, and it actually becomes a lot colder, even though the sun looks way bigger up there in the sky. So he says, you want to shoot a frequency, a beam, at the red sun. Now also keep this in mind: there are many suns, not just one that we see up in the sky today. In ancient times. There's various accounts and records that talk about different lights in the sky, different suns in ancient times, right? Um, the great sun, the great star, uh, the actual physical moon, etc., the eye in the sky illuminates whenever the energy in our world reverses and we can see the firmament. We can see what's up there and it glows red. And that is the great red sun and a beam will shoot up at that red sun up in the sky, which is the apex of the firmament, and a beam will hit that, and it will touch that. So this is all sort of subtly being shared with us. Um, I was just checking out the chat. All right, so anyways, um, so he's like, no, I'm not going to allow you to shoot a signal at the sun. So what does she do? She goes behind everyone's back. She aims the telescope right at the sun, which this is also symbolically the eye in the sky with the... With the um, the rivers of Eden, like we talked about before, right? The cross, the cross section, Nibiru, the planet of the cross or the crossing. And she aims that telescope at the sun and then she shoots it. Now, this is also kind of reminded me, it's hard to see because it's so dark right here, but you can see that they have um, this sort of vav shape. It's like, a, it's like this and then there's a point at the top of it, like a Y type of a shape. And it reminded me of this one too, which also has the three balls on the outside just like we talked about earlier. All right, now we get back to this character who wants to check out that game. Remember, she took off the headset? So she puts her headset back on and her hair stands up on end. She gets these spidey senses. This happens to Spider-Man too. It's electromagnetic in nature. Mandacat, thank you for your donation. I appreciate your support. So her hair stands up on end, electromagnet, uh, magnetic in nature. She gets back in here and you can see it's, it's no longer just desert, but it's all covered in snow. It's cold. And she meets this guy who says, I am the Count of the West. Now, esoterically speaking, we have arcane directions arcane cardinal directions. In the ancient world, they didn't have left and right as east and west. Up was east, down was west, okay? Down into the earth. This guy is the Count of the West. He represents a type of Osiris, who is known as the foremost of the Westerners, which is the first man, or the first man type of man, or man shape, which is the stick figure in the sky, which is spirit, which is soul. Um, Osiris and his spine, which is, all that symbolism is just that beam that shoots up from Mount Maru, right? The Count of the West, Osiris, etc. He says, your mission, the point of this video game helmet, your mission is to solve the riddle of this world. So is he speaking to her or is he speaking to you? I know he was speaking to me. My mission, what's the point here? What's the point of living? What's the point of all of this? Well, according to the movie, it seems to indicate that the point is to solve the riddle of the world. We're in a labyrinth. We're in a maze with changing walls all of the time, with distractions all over the place and a monster hunting us down, seeking our death. What's the point of it all? To escape the maze, to figure out the riddle of the world. So they start walking to the uh, pyramid back here in the background. And he says, this is a chaotic era. Except for stable eras, all times are chaotic eras. 
and you can see the sun flying past in the background there. When a new era arrives, the emperor consults great minds about the movements of the sun. Now, let me pause real quick. As they're showing you the sun moving around in the sky in the background, and he's talking about chaotic eras and stable eras, we go through this. The movie is not talking about some fictional land far away or some fictional earth, and this is never really going to happen. It's on point, describing to us what we are currently going through and reflecting to us things we have already gone through. This movie is a condensed version of our entire history. So he says, uh, there are chaotic eras and there are stable eras. Basically, you have what we live in right now where everything is pretty seemingly stable, right? Where there's not a lot of chaos, which is just all types of different things and fluctuations and monsters that, that live and vampires and uh, giants walking about and magic and, you know, all electricity all over the place and stuff that, I mean, it all depends on your perspective. I see that as stable, but, you know, people that live during this age would see it as chaotic. So we're talking about these two different worlds, these shifts that we go through. Every apocalyptic cycle is an electromagnetic reversal. So we go from one age, which is an age of magic, to another age, which is an age of no energy or no magic, basically. Okay? These are the different eras, chaotic and stable. The emperor consults great minds about the movements of the sun. You must decide. You must decide. We must decide. Whether an era is chaotic or stable. So let me ask you in the chat. I'm now looking at the chat. Would you say we live right now in the real world in a chaotic era or in a stable era? I just am curious. I'm just curious. There's no right or wrong answer. Okay, it's all based on your perspective. But I am curious. I'm gonna go back and see what you guys say. If Emperor Zhao is wrong, an entire civilization will be destroyed. So if they're wrong about the movements of the sun, right? Or these bodies in the sky. Our, our real ancestors, okay? The world across studied meticulously the heavens, the stars, the eclipses, comets, the movements of the, the celestial bodies, and they directly related to them to the start and the end of the calendar and to the apocalyptic cycles. And they, they created huge megaliths and whatnot, that lined up with the sun to make sure it was in the right place. Because if it didn't line up with these little holes in these huge megaliths, they knew that a chaotic era was coming. They knew that something bad was coming. The apocalypse was coming if it did not line up at these particular points in our year. Solstices and equinoxes. So she says, what? The whole civilization will be destroyed? How? How could that happen? And then it gets bright. And the sun comes up. And the Count of the West says, like this. And it's so bright. The sun is just unbearably bright and unbearably hot. And starts sizzling and melting away all of the snow that's around them. The wind picks up. It gets windy. And she can't handle it. Neither can he. So they hide in the shadow. And they try to find refuge in the shade of this little rock. Right? Which is also symbolic of going to Mount Maru. The rock of the world. The dome of the world. Etc. Uh, no, not the dome, the rock of the world, right? Uh, so they go and they hide in the shadow of this rock from the sunlight. And they show you, you know, that the sunlight is basically burning everything. This is our future. If things don't change, this is our future. Okay, that, where the sun gets more and more focused and it will get hotter and hotter as it shifts into the blue star or the blue star Kachina. So there's no, there's no room for this little girl in the shade so he's like you need to go over there and dehydrate yourself so she goes over there and the other girl's like oh my god she's gonna burn up and she starts her skin starts folding in on itself it looks like she's you know deflating or something and she just shrivels up right in front of everybody and then the guy rolls her up takes her skin rolls it up and he says those who dehydrate fast enough can can be preserved this is very interesting this whole dehydration thing in the uh show it just means to take water away from, right? 
Hey, Cake Town, thank you. I super <laughs> I just saw that in the chat. Thank you. Um, our world is going to dehydrate. Right now, we live in the water world. We live in a flooded world. There are there is an there's one ocean. I know they try to divide it and say there's seven seas and all that. No, there's not. There's one ocean, okay, which is proof of the flood that has come and gone. And it's also indicative of the type of era that we live in right now because the oceans are still here. That's a huge clue if you want to try to uh, piece back together the apocalyptic cycles. It's, it's to know where we stand today. There, we live in the water world, but this world will dehydrate and those world the, the water will be taken away. And people will find it easier. Basically, they'll they're so, they'll survive. Uh, all of this probably in the background used to be ocean, right? When the oceans are removed, we'll have deserts all over the place and tropical lands and stuff. And people will find new lands and they'll be able to go live in those lower levels where the the seafloor is. He says we rehydrate them when a stable era arrives. So according to them, a stable era is whenever there is hydration or water. So I don't know what you guys said in the chat earlier, but the movie is indicating that this is a stable era. That the flooded world, the hydrated world, is a stable era because there is no chaos that's happening all over the place where you live in the land of magic and monsters and mysticism and electricity and electrified amp atmosphere and stuff like that. So this is how people survive the chaotic eras. If one of us survives, we all survive. Now, this guy, you don't know it yet, but he and all these characters in the game represent these alien creatures, right? So what they're implying is that they are all a sort of complex um, spirit form or a hive mind, you could say, right? They're all connected and they, they recognize their connectivity with one another. Thanks again, Cake Town. Super appreciate you. Um, so that's not always a bad thing right? It just depends on your perspective. But it also goes back to that story of Brahma, the creator god, right? Uh, dividing and dividing and dividing. Eventually, everything returns to source. Everything returns to being one, right? All of the satanic and evil people in the world, they want everyone to join their team. All the people that go door knocking and religious people in the world, and they go tell everyone the good news and they insist that you believe what I believe. They want everyone to be on the same team. They all want everyone to come together, but just where they are instead of everyone uniting. So they show you the path that leads to the pyramid. Once again, the guy walks off and then she tells her friend. She starts telling her friend about this game that she found. And he's like, this guy's like, how does it work? She says, you just put it on. So he puts on the headset. And after he puts on the headset, he goes into the game and he's tripping. He's like, oh my God, this is insane. And then all of a sudden he hears a voice that says, you were not invited. And this girl with the katana comes out whoosh, and slices his head off. And he's like, oh my God, what the heck? And he takes it off. Uh, he was not invited to play this game, which is symbolic of figuring out the apocalypse. There's, he's not one of the people that he's stumbled upon this information. So he was killed. <laughs> you see what I'm saying, right? So anyways, he puts it back on. He's like, whatever, it's just a video game. He puts it back on, gets his head cut off again. I could taste blood that time, he says. So they're continuing to have a conversation and then the, and then the camera zooms into their phone. So you're going to play, huh? Okay, you're going to play the game. Meanwhile, their conversation is being recorded from their phone, their personal cell phones, which goes all the way back to this guy, the watcher, who works for the governments of the world, right? The highest elite. What that's telling us, I don't have my phone here, but is your devices have the capability, if they have the capability to project and, and put sounds out there, and they have recording stuff, they have video cameras, all that, we would be so ignorant to assume that we're not being recorded, that we're not being monitored, that we're not being uh, watched, basically, right? Um, especially if you get into simulation theory, like that's the that's the purpose of a simulation is you want to simulate an environment and watch and see what happens, right? So that's sort of what they're showing us here. Remember, there's different levels to these things. Now, 
That same guy with the beard, he really wanted to participate. So this box arrives in his house. He has no idea where it came from. He goes up to it. It's got his name, Jack Rooney, written on the top of it. So he knows it's for him. Opens it up. And it's one of those visors. And it says, we invite you to play. So now he's expressed an interest in this game, which is figuring out the apocalypse. And he's now been invited because he's proven himself. He, he went back time and time again, even though he wasn't welcome or he wasn't invited. He persisted. He kept at it. And eventually he was invited, right? You could interpret that in quite a, in quite a few different ways too. Anyways, he gets this little helmet and he puts it on his head and he gets the one eye symbolism, boom. And then all of a sudden he's taken back and he sees this castle, which represents Mount Maru. Once again, they're all seeing the same thing. It's just painted differently because it's it's being put through their own perception filters, things that they can relate to, things that they're used to, where one person would see a pyramid or uh, an, an, an unfinished pyramid. Uh, another person would see a temple. Another person would see a tower. Another person would see a castle. But they're all connected, being that they represent the same thing. It's the same path, the same blue world, headed towards this one thing that represents Mount Maru. Now, he sees this little NPC-type guy in the video game. He goes to meet him and stuff. He's dressed all different and stuff. And then we flash back to another character. This character is a professor, and he's in his uh, class teaching. And he says, so... If the many worlds theory is true, this means that there could possibly be an infinite number of Jessicas or Vishals. He's talking about the Fractalverse. Notice in the background that same type of shape I showed you earlier too. He's talking about the Fractalverse or what people commonly call the Multiverse, which I believe it's really fractal and holographic in nature. Um, and he's saying if that's true, then there are exact copies of everything out there. It's all replicating itself because it's Brahma splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting. And what else can Brahma do but make more Brahmas, which are going to have all the coding of the original Brahma or God, however you like to say it. I'm just, you know, I'll use different descriptors. But it's all the same. It's fractal in nature. It's holographic in nature. In a hologram, if you cut off a tiny little corner of it, it contains all of the information for the whole. For the rest of the hologram and it just repeats itself no matter how many times you you fracture it no matter how many times you divide it it's the same so if we leave this world this earth and we venture out past the dome of the sky and the firmament i theorize that we would just end up in another earth it would be the same thing you would you it, you'd be in another world another another version of this world now, would it be the exact same? No, because they're all different simulations. They're all slightly different in order to cover every single possible outcome, every part of quote unquote reality, because you're experiencing yourself or Brahma is experiencing itself or God is experiencing itself. And therefore, if God is infinite, it has to cover infinitely. Even the slightest derivation, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, derivative. You know what I mean? So there's an infinite number of us's out there. Isn't that interesting? When you look up at the sky and pray, you might just be talking to yourself, actually. That also means inversely, if we go down into our own bodies or into anything, really, we'll find infinite worlds, infinite dimensions that just continue on and on and on. And we only call them small in comparison. So infinite Mr. Downing's in the multiverse, he says. So when your consciousness ends or when you die in one world, it could continue to exist in another world, being that our, our multiverse selves, I'll, I'll call them, are tethered, that we are entangled with each other on the quantum level. Because it's not each other, it's just one. It's just us. It's the same. Which is why you can have quantum entanglement where you seemingly have two different objects that are entangled at the quantum level. This one turns blue. At the same time, this one will turn blue. This one vibrates. At the same time, this one will vibrate. And it can happen instantaneously. You can put those, those atomic particles uh, millions and millions and millions of miles apart. You can affect one and the other one will respond at the exact same time, 
instantly. Who's to say that your spirit and all the other versions of you out there aren't built in similar in a similar fashion? I'll say. Right? So when when one person or one version of J Dreamers kicks the bucket, dies, or seems to die in this world, instantly whoosh, um, I'm just experiencing an, another life, another version of me. There is no death, basically. It just continues on. It's eternal life and living. Anyways, I'm just, I'm just, you know, being a philosopher, I'll say. Um, so he says, it could continue to exist. The spirit, the soul could continue to exist in many other worlds. That there is no just darkness and the television set turns off and it's black and it's nothing and there's nothing happening. No, it can't be. It's got to be life. That's what that's what God is. That's the whole concept of God. Is not nothing. It's everything. So it it can't go against its own nature. You know what I mean? Now we get back to the video game. The girl's put on the video game and she's gone before uh, this emperor. And the emperor is asking the wisest men um, to tell him when the next uh, stable era will be. So that he can rehydrate the people or basically bring them back to life or repopulate the world. And he says, the code is complete. It will answer your questions. And this guy's taking these sticks and he's put them on the ground. And he's basically made the I Ching, right? A form of divination. And that's what she says. She's like, Emperor, this is the I Ching. It's beautiful, but it's not scientific, Right? Remember, there's a balance between the two. There's a balance between academics and fact and science, empirical evidence, etc., and religion and spirituality and beliefs and feelings and emotions and all these things and myths and legends. There's a balance between the two. She says it's beautiful, but it's not scientific. I don't think it's going to solve your problem. Right? So the the guy who, who represents divination is trying to figure out when the apocalypse is going to happen, basically. And she says, it doesn't follow any physical laws. Now, remember, she's talking to someone that represents the old ways, the old world, this emperor. And he's like, physical laws? He's lost. He's like, what are you talking about? We mean physical laws. <laughs> she's like, yeah, the laws of physics. Let's be redundant, right? The laws of physics. Everything we've we've observed to be true about the world. There's that's that's this that's the mark of a true academic. They like we their team mentality, right? Everything we have observed about the tr uh, to be true about the world, to which the man who represents the old world responds and says, "Which world?" And he's dead serious. That just blows her mind wide open, right? She's saying this is. The laws of physics are everything we've observed. Uh, we have observed. I hate that word. Everything we have observed about this, about the world. She says the world as if it, the Earth is the only world, right? Other worlds, other realms have different conditions and therefore different laws, different ways that things play out and pan out. So he says, which world? Hey, I want to say thanks for the donation in the chat, Morris. Quantum entanglement could be experienced as deja vu. I like that. All right, continuing on. This guy's put all the sticks down on the floor. They all start to glow and light up as the emperor has asked his question, when will the next uh, stable era be? Right? And it also sort of resembles that same square within the square that I showed you earlier too at the nanotechnology place. He says the chaotic era will last another eight days. <clears throat> This is your one week of creation, basically. Thanks again, Morris. High five. So another eight days and they will, re they will get to a, st a stable era, right? So right now they're in a chaotic era. After eight days, they will go into a stable era. He says, when it is over, we will enjoy a glorious stable era for 63 years. With a climate so mild, it will be a golden age. That's interesting. Let the days fly past. So then they look up, just like in the dark crystal. Except for this is a square opening, the other one was a triangular opening. This is, this is so close to the dark crystal, right? He says, let the days fly past. This is so interesting. In order to get to the apocalypse, they always speed up time. 
It's a quickening of days that they experience, which is one of the omens of the apocalypse that being upon the people. I'm, I'm God. That's happening now. We, this is happening to us. It's just that we're the frog in the pot and the temperature slowly rising. And we don't, we don't recognize the gradual changes as they increase and increase and get a little faster and a little faster. People don't realize that the days are just whipping and zipping by. That, that point of focus up there in the sky is speeding up. That entropy is increasing and that uh, the energy in our world is being siphoned and sucked down into the bowels of the earth faster and faster. And our world is falling apart quicker and quicker and lifespans are receding and declining. And people are just grown used to it. But the days fly past. That's the quickening of time, the quickening of the days, the shortening of the days as it's referenced in the Bible. And that's one of the omens. This will happen before the apocalypse. So he says that, that we need to fast forward eight days, right? And then he says, rehydrate. So he's going to repopulate the world. And they take all the dehydrated people, toss them into the water, right? So the waters come back. You've got the water world and the desert world, right? So all the people are tossed into the waters and the, the water starts to come back into their body and they basically somehow come back to life and they, they rehydrate or whatever, right? Um, and then as soon as this happens, they look up at the sky and they see that the sun starts getting smaller and smaller and it starts getting colder and colder because it's getting further away. And then this cold comes in and it gets freezing cold and all these people just become frozen statues. She goes to try to save this little girl. Second she touches her, she just breaks into pieces <clears throat> because she's frozen solid. Now, the ninja lady shows up. She's sort of the narrator for the whole video game. The ninja lady shows up and she says, Civilization number 137 was obliterated by extreme cold. They are showing you and me our past apocalyptic cycles, our past cataclysms. <clears throat> things that we have already been through um what do they call that the uh the ice age right the ice age is according to academics slowly happens over millions of years or whatever no it doesn't it comes very quickly and it freezes mammoths in place and makes ice statues out of a great many things <clears throat> she says you did not save them but you did establish the superiority of science over mysticism. In level two, you must use science to save the next civilization. Now, imagine, just put on the brakes real quick, that the movie, imagine the movie is talking to us. And it's not showing us some, some aliens, you know, their apocalypses that they went through, which is what they're showing you. Um, but they're showing us ours and they're saying we need to use, we need to step out of the archaic world and divination and all that stuff, which did not work in the past. And we need to balance that out with some science and some studying and some research. I'm not saying all of, all of science is, um, bad or anything. I'm just saying it's, it's imbalanced. It's, it's unbalanced at this point in time. Right? So we've gone too far in the other direction. We've gone from just divination and spiritual and this and that all the way, way too far to the other end of the spectrum where it's just all academics. In level two, you must use science to save the next civilization. Why? Because these apocalyptic cycles can be figured out. They can be, we, we can reverse engineer them to determine and, and, and know what's coming. And what to expect. And that gives us a leg up on surviving. So she looks up at the sky. And this is what happens. Three suns or three circles or three heavenly bodies all line up in the sky. And look at the, at the shape they create. This is the type of the doom shape that I was talking about earlier. This is the syzygy. This is the triple eclipse of the three bodies, the heavenly bodies up there in our in our firmament. And this is an example of what we're looking at. Um, this is, um, 
from the Thunderbolts of the Gods, I believe, that they made this presentation. Um, they're showing you the glyphs that people recorded on the right and the, and, the, and the carvings and stuff where people drew what they saw in the sky, which were these three bodies, one gigantic one, which is that huge inverted dome, and then another one at the center of that, and then the depressurization point in the middle. And you can see that it has, depending on how the light is moving around it, it can create its own uh, phases, basically, where you have this portion at the bottom, which creates this upside down crescent moon. And the upside down crescent moon is seen across the world in different cultures on flags and uh, symbolic of different religions and stuff like that. These are the, also the horns, right those that upside down moon creates like horns and it creates uh the horns of the goat or the ox or you know these different gods that people saw up in the sky here's another version of it you know these are just artist depictions but this is the doom shape these are those three bodies lining up in the sky and and it gets really deep into optics and how you know we, we optically visibly, visibly see things and how the atmosphere affects that and how the light affects that and stuff. But there comes a time when these three circles line up in the sky and plasma comes down out of an opening in our, in our very ceiling of our world. And it stretches down into our world and grounds itself to the earth and terraforms the world and changes the world as we know it. Now, we go back to this girl, the Chinese girl that sent out the message to the sun. She's back hard at work, listening to codes and trying to listen to see if she gets a signal. Looks up, and all of a sudden, the signal starts going into flux. Bzz, 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 starts fluctuating. And she knows that she's getting a response from some sort of intelligent life from beyond. The computer translates it, and it says, You are lucky that I am the first to receive your message. And she's like, Oh my God. Someone's responding. It goes on to say, I am warning you, do not answer, do not respond. If you respond to this message, we will come. We got 270 likes. Oh, thanks for letting me know, Jim. Jim Donovan in the chat. 270 likes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. I'm, thank you all. Thank you all for liking the video. That's very kind. <clears throat> all right. Um, and he says, your world will be conquered. If you respond to these frequencies, these signals, your world will be conquered. This is going to get so deep. We're, we're just getting started. Now, she looks around and she's, she's been told, don't respond or your world's going to get conquered. We'll take over. So she responds. She starts typing out a message and she, she types out, go ahead and come. We cannot save ourselves. I will help you conquer this world. And she presses the send button. Boom. She sends out the message. I love this part. I love it because this is, this is how I, I resonate with that. I, I look around at the state of the world today, the condition that, that humanity is in. Lost. Deprived. Upside down. Decrepit. Sick in body, mind, and spirit, and it's just multiplying and multiplying, she's saying we can't save ourselves. It needs to end. Go ahead and come. I will help you conquer this world. Which means that she's ready to transition. She's ready for a change. And I vibe with that. Now, the next episode picks up at CERN, right? A lot of people have theories about what's going on at CERN. In the chat, what is your theory? What do you think if it's more than just particle physics and they're just spinning light around in a circle to just see what it's made out of, what do you suppose they might really be doing? It is a government organization and the government lies. So <laughs> just put two and two together. Anyways, uh, they show you Shiva, right? They have this, they have this famous um, statue outside of CERN of the god Shiva. Now I was talking about Brahma earlier. In Hinduism, they have their sort of triune god or their own holy trinity. They have many different gods, right? But the main original three are Brahma at the top, the creator god. Remember I said Brahma split himself into two and then those ones split themselves and those ones split themselves, right? So there's Brahma. There is Shiva, 
Now, Shiva is the destroyer god. Shiva is known as the god that is associated with plasma or snakes, which you can see wrapped around Shiva. This is like the king snake or serpent, right? Or Naga. Um, Shiva is seen as being the sleeping god or the meditating god. And when that god awakes or awakens and the third eye opens, that's when the apocalypse comes, when Shiva wakes up. From meditating. Shiva is the destroyer of worlds, sometimes seen as being evil because of that, but it's not. It's just natural. It's just a part of the cycles. And then you have Vishnu, and Vishnu is the god that lives within each world, or the terrestrial energy, the beam of energy that, that shoots up out of the heart of the earth, or out of the soul, right? Those are the three creator gods. So they show you Shiva here, which is the destroyer, which is appropriate because that's at CERN, the destroyer. Now, this is also directly related to a story um, in Hinduism where someone came to Shiva. I'm just going to summarize the story, okay? But I did a whole video on this. Basically, Shiva was asked to destroy the world, but the world was protected and it could only be destroyed whenever these three cities, these floating cities up in the, up in the sky, allegedly, um, all aligned. And when they were in perfect alignment, these three bodies, one arrow could be shot, piercing all three of them, which would bring about the destruction of the world. And Shiva was the destroyer. So Shiva is the one that had to wield the bow. Vishnu was the beam or the god of the earth, the terrestrial energy of the earth that shoots out as an actual beam and goes right up to those three heavenly bodies or cities in the story. There were these floating cities, right? Uh, and that's called tri or Tripura or Tripura, you could say. Very interesting story. I did a whole video about it in my Plasma Apocalypse playlist. You can look that up if you'd like to. But it's all symbolic of our apocalyptic cycles that we go through. So, the, de the, the detective is at CERN. He looks back. You can see that he's checking out Shiva, the statue of Shiva over here, with a circle around it. That circle has these little flames all the way around it because this is a two-dimensional representation, the circle, of the dome that is upside down looking at us at the apex of the firmament. And flames come out of it, or plasma comes out of it when it opens up. So, this guy finally finds one of those VR headsets. Um, and then, oh, they're trying to figure out the video game, right? So now she's talking to her buddy with the beard because remember he got his own VR headset and now they're doing like two player mode and they're trying to figure out, you know, the point of it together. And she says, the sword lady said that we're supposed to use science to save the next civilization, right? And he's like, okay, so we need to come up with a way to predict the next stable era. It's all about trying to figure out what is happening in our actual real world so that we don't just blindly go through life and just whenever the apocalypse comes, oh well, it, it comes and it will come. It, it, it's inevitable. The apocalypse comes and people are almost always caught off guard. They're caught unaware because they lose sight of it. It's ancient oblivion. It's obliterated from our memories. It's, it's, a, it's an oubliette basically. It's uh, something we have forgotten about, or it's been hidden, and only those in the know survive, because they're prepared, and they're researching, and they're ready, or they're more likely to survive. So, we need to come up with a way to predict the next stable era, right? And how long will it last for? We have clues in our world today that can help us to figure this out. Um, what you're looking at right now on the screen are these stripes, these black and white stripes. These represent time, okay? Academics labels these sections of time in millions of years, but I don't believe in millions of years, okay? I believe that they have, um, the way that they have, have figured out the age of substances and stuff is all wrong and they have not taken into consideration that it's exponentially degrading and therefore time is speeding up right so what on this chart may be millions of years in the past is actually only thousands that's that's how i see it at least so we are here right behind me 
right? These are different eras. These are different epics. These represent polarity shifts or electromagnetic reversals on Earth. And the way that they have figured these out is they've, you know, there's different ways that they can do it. They've looked at ice core samples. They've looked at um, volcanic rocks. They've looked at tree rings and all these different things. And they can see these patterns, right? This black one is our most recent one. When our electromagnetics have been the way they are, going all the way back, and then this little tiny sliver is the last little cycle of apocalyptic events, and then the last one, these are your stable and chaotic eras. If the black represents the flooding of the world and us having an ocean, let's just suppose, right? Then the white represents the tropical world or the desert world or the world without an ocean, right? So you can take a look at these and you can start sort of getting an idea of what has happened in the past. Now, something to consider and something of importance if we zoom in on where we are today. They call this the Bruins era. I'll just call it, okay? Look how big that is. Look how big this chunk of how long we've been in this era for since the last depressurization. I'm just going to assume that that's what that is, okay? That means that when it finally, when our atmosphere finally does depressurize, which I believe kicks off the apocalypse when the sky opens up again, it's going to be extremely volatile, extremely dangerous. One of the worst apocalypses ever, because every time the white meets the black, that's an apocalyptic scenario. That's a cataclysm, the world across. And when you have a whole bunch of one, and then it happens, that means it's been saving up all that pressure for a very long time, and that pressure release is going to be super strong, which leads to a very strong apocalypse, a very bad apocalypse, I'm going to say, where a lot of people don't make it. These lesser ones are easier to survive. There's been less time in between them. So... Um, there's not as much pressure that's been building up and building up in order to release it, right? But this is huge. And whenever it does release, it's going to be catastrophic. So these are, these are things that we can look at, right? And she has a little whiteboard in her, in her house. And she, she's been taking note. The world froze. The world froze. The world burnt. People suffocated. The world froze. The world froze. This suffocation is due to... Um, Atmospheric depressurization, basically. So they both put on the video game, and then they're, they're in like two-player mode. And they go before this uh, pope, and he says, oh, I'm Francis Bacon. And she says, I'm Copernicus. They have to put on, they have to, they have to come up with these like different names. So Francis Bacon, Copernicus, the pope happens to be Pope Gregory. We'll also meet some other characters here in a bit. Uh, this is Aristotle. Galileo, over here on the left and the right, Pope Gregory, etc. All of these characters, all of these names, are people who investigated and looked into alternative cosmologies, the shapes of the world, people who changed times, people who tried to figure out what time we lived in, players in this game that they're showing us, right? So she, she puts forth her theory that they live in a three-body system where there's these three stars or three, three suns and that the planet is shifting between those three suns, which is why you get chaotic and stable eras. He goes, burn her. <laughs> She's coming up with a contrary idea. Burn her. So the whole world becomes burned. You see the three different objects, the three bodies in the sky. This is what is on the way, I believe. That we're coming up on the apocalypse by fire. Civilization, the sword lady comes back. Civilization number 152 was destroyed by a tri-solar day. That is how ours will be destroyed. By a quote-unquote tri-solar day. It'll be destroyed by the sun. There will be other things too. Lewis, hey, welcome to my channel, Lewis. All right, so now they put on level... They're on like another level of the game... And they're like, where are we? And he says, I think we're in Xanadu, where Kublai Khan decreed his stately pleasure dome. Now, this is interesting, right? You see all these people. There's, this is like an army, and they're all holding up these signs. On one side of the sign, it's white. On the other side, it's black. And 
all these armies are used as a type of computer. They just go back and forth between black and white, representing ones and zeros. Now, Xanadu, um, it's, you know, it used to be allegedly an actual place. It also, when people reference a place that's like Xanadu, it means a type of paradise. It also was the original name for the World Wide Web, or the idea for the internet. Which is interesting because they have a whole army here that represents a gigantic computer. So, this emperor has his wise men as Sir Isaac Newton and Professor Turing. Right? One who invented calculus and the other one who is a computer expert. And hopefully, calculus and computers will help us to figure out uh, the apocalypse, basically. Right? So, they give these commands to the armies which represent a gigantic organic computer. They start flipping their signs back and forth, going between ones and zeros, flapping all over the place. And they say, yeah, you're safe. You know, same as last time. Uh, there'll be a chaotic era. They fast forward time. Time speeds up again. And um, they think that they're going to be safe. They believe that their technology has saved them or their gigantic computer system has saved them. But it cannot. You cannot predict the end of the world. You have to read the signs. You have to look for the omens. You cannot predict when the world will end. It is mathematically impossible. A computer cannot do it. A supercomputer cannot do it. We don't have the information for the original conditions of the world when it was first enveloped by a dome and everything that was in that world and the conditions of that world. And due to chaos theory... If you don't have all of the initial conditions, every single X factor, over time, it will go into flux and your predictions will be off every single time. So beware of people who are giving you exact dates for the apocalypse. Beware of people who, who boast and are proudly telling you when the world will come to an end, creating cults and followings of people who just want a simple McDonald's drive through fast food answer. Instead of doing the work, instead of opening their eyes and their minds and their ears and their hearts and their spirits and their energy to Mother Nature and seeing what is obvious all over the place and all around us, the signs are everywhere and it's evident when it's nearby, when it's close. You read and pay attention to the omens. I cannot predict it. But I will read the omens. <laughs> And I'll share, you know, my feelings with all of you for as long as I, you know, this is my, my path. So anyways, they look up in the sky and they see the three bodies coming together once more in a triple eclipse, all in a line. And this is, this is what brings about the apocalypse, is those three bodies coming together, right? Because eventually everything re returns to source. Even those energies that are outside of our dome, even those ones that are inside, they all come to a point before they go into flux. Or they go into flux and then they come into a point once again. He looks up and says, it's a syzygy. Now what happens? When this happens, the atmosphere depressurizes. That is why it's an apocalypse, because apocalypse means to uncover. It's a physical, actual uncovering. I know people want to spiritualize it and be like, oh, it's like an awakening. Nothing will actually physically happen. Yes, it is an awakening, but it's an apocalypse on all levels, including the physical one. Including the actual physical world we live in, we will have a physical apocalypse, and we have before. When the sky opens, our atmosphere depressurizes. And that is is what this guy sees when he looks down at his army. He says, what is happening to my army? The atmosphere depressurizes. And what happens is all of the atmosphere that gets sucked out is basically a type of liquid form or a fluid, right? And all of the fluid that gets sucked out will be replaced by an equally buoyant force that pushes everything up from underneath which causes things to float, especially if it's been a really long time since the last pressure release. That's a lot of pressure that's going to escape. That's a lot of atmosphere that's going to be, get sucked out of the sky and past the firmament, which will take things up with it, 
causing everything to become weightless as buoyancy increases in the world that we live in. If you have more pressure, it creates more of a sense of what we call gravity today, but it's not. It's just that there's a lot of atmospheric pressure. There's a lot of pressure all over the place that's built up over time. A lot of things are being introduced into this system or born into the system and multiplying and, and, other, and other factors as well that creates a lot of pressure, right? Um, and when you put a lot of pressure, like let's say you have a two liter bottle and you have like a little guy whose equilibrium is perfect in the middle and he can float and you have, you got a, a water bottle, a two liter bottle is full of water and there's a little floating guy in the middle. If you squeeze that water bottle, he will get gravity. He will sink down to the bottom and he'll stay there until you release the pressure of that water bottle. That little guy will float right back up. And that's what happens when you have a pressure release as things float up into the sky they float up into the heavens. Anything that is not tied down, especially water, all water that is not contained, will float up into the sky. The oceans will disappear. People, animal, technology, cars will fly. They will float up into the sky. And this, is, this has been shown to us before. This is the god, the ancient god, Kronos which is that circle up in the sky, the horned one. He's got, you know, Medusa's, all that plasma comes out, looks like spikes and stuff. This is Kronos eating his creation, sucking it all up into its mouth. This is your rapture event for people that believe in the rapture and stuff like that. Now, after they witness everything getting sucked up into the sky due to atmospheric depressurization, I'm going to call it, uh, the sword lady comes back and she says, you have now entered level four. So as we start learning why these things happen and all of the correlated uh, events, we can start seeing that they're not just, you know, totally different unrelated things. They're all completely related. You have now entered level four. Now we go back to that rich guy. Remember at the very beginning, I showed you the guy who got into the helicopter and he has something to do with the aliens. Well, he is in communication with the aliens. <clears throat> and he can talk to them. Uh, he's using a microphone, so he's talking to them through the microphone. They, they actually, he doesn't need the microphone because they can hear him anyway. I'll explain that in a bit. But there's a speaker, which is how he can hear them. That's the important part. And he's reading the aliens. He's, he's teaching them about humanity, and he's reading them a fairy tale, which is very interesting. The tale of Hansel and Gretel, he says. And then the alien says, you said that the boy Hansel was afraid, but the girl was not. So this, this hive mind, this, um, this, this complex hive mind, basically. Okay. Um, they all experience their emotions and information instantly with one another. So they're trying to they're trying to understand this division that humanity seems to live in. And Hansel was afraid, but Gretel was not. And she doesn't understand that, or the alien doesn't understand that. And she says, but it appears you, you as, as a species, have ceased to be afraid um, because you have contacted us. Then the alien says, out of the speaker here, a lack of fear leads to extinction. When we have become so bold and we have lost all sense of fear, which in the old world meant respect for the world that we live in and for reality and our, and our way of life and nature. When we have lost all fear of um, the apocalypse coming, it leads to extinction when people lose their, their, their sense of fear or respect for nature. If your ancestors had followed the fearless, you would not exist. So if our ancestors had gone the way of being bold and fearless and not having any respect, not following nature's laws and, and abiding by balance, then everything is thrown into a chaotic era, which we do ourselves, and the apocalypse comes, which is the great reset, the, the great leveler. Humanity must learn to fear again. Now, I know we've been conditioned to think, oh, fear is a bad thing. That's fear porn. That's fear. You know, you're just trying to get people to be afraid and this and that. Fear is a tool. It is respect, which means to look at something again, which means to reconsider, to rethink, 
and to change our minds, to change our ways of thinking and how we think, which lead to physical changes in the world and actions. Humanity must learn to fear again. We've lost all respect for nature and we've lost sight of the apocalypse. We have no fear. All of these holidays, today, where I live right now, it's Easter. It's called Easter, okay? And Easter, or the, the equinox, I mean, uh, yeah, the equinoxes, okay? The equinoxes and the solstices, these are the times when the apocalypse have happened in the past. And therefore, we have set up these markers, or the survivors of the past have set up these markers at these solstices and equinoxes um, to, to celebrate. It's not really celebration. It's an observation. It's to observe the sky. It's to look at the sky and to see if the apocalypse is going to happen. And they had a, a reverence. They had a respect. They had a fear that their world might go into flux and change and the apocalypse would happen and millions of people would die. And so they set up these customs and these traditions and these holy days or set apart times when you needed to be inside. You needed to light candles. You needed to have a light source. You needed to be prepared and have food and be around family. But we've lost sight of that. Now instead, people go outside and they hide a bunch of eggs and they smash a bunch of candy and sugar and chocolate like bugs or insects just feeding on sugar, which will come up later. Humanity needs to learn to fear again. So they're back in the video game and she says, um, when you know that your planet is doomed, what is the solution? So they've explained to them that yes, they do live, these aliens way out there in space, um, their planet lives in a, um, a three star system. They don't have one sun, they have three suns, okay? And they know that they cannot accurate, accurately predict the motion of those three bodies, which is like a scientific paradox or problem. Um, and therefore, they can never keep themselves from resetting, their civilization from resetting. They know they're doomed. So she's being hypothetical and she's saying, when you know that your planet is doomed, what is the solution? And they say, flee. You have to leave the world. You have to you have to get out of there, right? This is what NASA is doing. This is what Elon Musk and the other space agencies are doing. They're doomsday preppers and they're getting ready to leave before or when the apocalypse comes, when when the time is right and the door is open. When those portals open in the sky or stargates or whatever you want to call them. They have rockets and and all that stuff. And I'm going to talk to you more about the ones that stay and how they fight the aliens talk about that too. Our only chance of survival lies elsewhere, right? So they're fractal verse travelers. Now we go back to this boat. The rich guy, remember the rich guy with the helicopter? Well, this is his boat. He, he owns all, a whole bunch of stuff, but this is his boat and it's called Judgment Day. This is his base of operations. You can see he has a satellite right up here for sending signals to the aliens. This, he, he's communicating with the aliens as I showed you earlier, right? And his boat is called Judgment Day. Right? So they're, they're being very in your face, putting it right there. They're talking about our judgment day, the day when humanity appears to be judged. And it comes when humanity's at its worst. So that's when judgment t tends to come for a criminal, right? You, be, you break the law, you get judged or whatever. Now, we go back to the rich guy. That's this guy right here. He's still talking to the aliens and he's reading them these fairy tales. Right now, he's reading... Uh, Little Red Riding Hood. And then the alien who sort of thinks, almost sounds like a computer, like AI would, right? The computer, or not the computer, the alien is taking him very literally. And the alien says, the wolf, he intends to eat her. And he says, yes. So why does she remain in the house? Right? Little Red Riding Hood. Why does she remain in the house? When she knows the wolf intends to eat her, this doesn't make sense. And that's logical. That's a reasonable question. And he goes, well, she doesn't know that the wolf intends to eat her. And then the alien says, or he says, uh, the wolf didn't, I'm sorry, Little Red Riding Hood didn't know the wolf's intentions. He, the, the wolf was hiding his intentions from Little Red Riding Hood. And the aliens are unfamiliar with this concept. He says, don't you ever hide your intentions? He asks the alien civilization that's on their way to Earth. Can't you lie? 
And they say, no, we do not, we're not aware of that concept. What is known between us is communicated as soon as communication takes place. There is no hiding their thoughts from one another. This will happen in our world. This used to be the way it was. But because energy is receding and dissipating and going back down into the bowels of the earth, we don't, we no longer have telepathy. Okay. And we can, we, we, there's, you know, we can basically hide our thoughts from each other. Okay. Because all that energy is not reaching out and you can feel what other people are thinking and stuff. So he says, so you communicate through thought and he realizes these aliens are telepathic. And the aliens are surprised and they're like, do you do this? Do you lie? And he says, well, you know, yeah, I mean, sometimes I try not to lie, but you know, blah, blah, blah. And he makes a bunch of excuses. When in reality, that's not good. <laughs> and then they say the wolf, he's also lying. We would like to speak to him. So they believe the story is a, is a real story and they believe the wolf is real and they want to talk to the wolf. So he says, what? No, it's, it's, it's not real. It's a story. None of them exist. And he's trying to convince the alien species that are just being pure of heart and they believe that they're being told the truth by this guy and they're starting to realize they're being lied to by being told this story. He's, and so the alien says, so the story is a lie about a liar. And he goes, yeah, I suppose it is. I mean, imagine this, right? You're, you're, you're learning about humanity from this guy who admits now that he's telling you a lie and it's all about a liar and everything seems to be based off of deception. And to him, it's just normal. To him, he's like, so what? Who cares? So it's just a lie. It's just a story, etc. Now, I just did a video about the dogmen, the tribe of the dog-headed creatures. And if you want to know more about the story, the children's story, and this lie, it's not a lie, of um, Goldilocks, not Goldilocks. I mean, that's probably related too. But... Um, Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf. My, my point with this, definitely go check out that video. But uh, my point is, it's not a lie. This guy thinks it's a lie. He thinks it's a story. He thinks it's made up and it's just to put little children to sleep. And it's just for amusement, which means to not think. A muse. Muse means to think. A means without in that language. So without thought. If you're amused, you're without thought. That's why we do truth in movies. We're not, we're not here to talk about how good or bad the movie was, but we're here to glean and learn and resonate with the truth that's offered to us. This guy thinks it's just a story. He thinks it's a lie. The reality is none of these children's tales or fairies' tales are lies. They're all based on truth, on fact, on history. On science. They're just cartoonified. They've been warped over time and by perspective. So she says, a liar is someone whose words are false. A liar cannot be trusted. We cannot coexist with liars. We are afraid of you. And he calls the aliens Lord, by the way. He says, my Lord, are you there? But they're not there. They stopped talking to him right then and there. Okay, so this is this is how it should go if you're in a toxic relationship with like a, between a man and a woman, okay? And one of you comes to your senses and realize the other person is toxic and bad for you. A healthy person walks away. A healthy person says, oh, you're toxic. I just realized that. I don't wish to be toxic, so goodbye. And she, the aliens just cut off communication. This guy represents somebody who's toxic, and he's still, he's like the, the, the boyfriend that got dumped, or it could be a girlfriend or whatever, but he's like, are you there? Talk to me. Hold on. Don't go. Wrong, buddy. You just told her you're a liar. You just told her you cannot be trusted, and not just you, but all of humanity, that you can't be trusted, that you're a liar, That's that that's a that's that's just life for you. 
And we're on to bigger and better things over here. Truth seekers. You get what I'm saying? All right. So they're talking about the alien civilization, the detective and the Chinese lady who first sent out that signal. And they, we learned the name of the alien civilization. They're called the Santi. The Santi. And he's like, why did you talk to them if they told you don't, don't talk to us? The Santi, which is sort of a play on saint or the saints or those of the saints. Also, Satan. It could be You could rearrange these letters easily and make Satan, right? That's because the aliens, who are all energetically linked together, represent that red plasma, that ionized hydrogen that is wrapped around our world just waiting to come in and invade, will come in one of these days. And that energy comes in to reshape the world. And therefore, it is seen as the destroying energy. Because it does destroy. But it destroys and so that other things can be created. It makes way for creation to, to be born. You know what I mean? So it's seen as the enemy or whatnot. Now, there's also, this is, there's different layers to this. One layer is that these, inner, these aliens represent plasma that comes in, which is also spirit, but it's energy that comes into our world, okay? And we battle that energy, or the good energy battles the bad energy. It also represents physical, actual alien beings that float down into this world. Uh, once the depressurization reaches an equilibrium, things just float down. They don't fall or anything. They just float. Um, real creatures, real quote-unquote aliens. I call them fractalverse travelers if they're purposefully traveling the fractalverse and they purposefully are flying around in rocket ships and stuff like that. Um, they're bipedal phantazoids, the aliens that come down. They're us. They're other versions of us from other worlds who have escaped. And they're coming down into the other worlds to tell their other versions of themselves the truth. Which is, makes sense to me. That's what I plan on doing. I plan on leaving this world one of these days, hundreds of years from now, and getting in touch with the other versions of J-Dreamers out there and waking myself up and teaching myself these things if I would like to know them. If I'm ready for those things. Um, anyways, the fractal verse traveling, right? I sort of lost my train of thought, so let's continue on. All right, so this is the Judgment Day boat. Uh, they set it up in a trap because they wanted to get like the information. Um, they recorded the conversations with the aliens, so they needed to destroy this boat because it was all protected. So the boat went through all those nanotechnologies, little tiny fibers that that girl created that split that diamond. They used the same technology to destroy this boat and also... They totally murdered everybody on it, which included women and children and everybody. Innocent people. And they didn't care because the ends justified the means to them. That is a poor mode of thought. That is why the world was flooded last time technology got out of control. The ends justified the means. They didn't look at humanity. They didn't look at life. They didn't look at the people. They just destroyed every... They murdered everybody on this boat to get some information because the ends justified the means. There was no balance. It was the left-hand path, and that was it. And so this boat is basically just split at the molecular level, like Swiss cheese or whatever. Now, um, the government dude and that scientist girl, they sort of are teaming up, and they both put on two-player mode. They put on the visors at the same time, and they start talking to this AI version of the alien people, the sword chick. And she says, our species is doomed. She's telling them this because they, this guy over here, he believes that they're coming to take over the planet and they're going to kill everybody and they're going to, it's going to be an invasion. But she reassures him, no, you guys will beat us. Our species is doomed. She says, how long will the fleet of our people take to reach your earth? So she's trying to use the Socratic method. She's asking them questions so that they say the answers and they give themselves the answers. So she says, 400 years. You'll be here in 400 years. An advanced alien species is on their way, but it's going to take them 400 years to get to Earth. So she says, that's why we're doomed. It's going to take them 400 years of not advancing, of just traveling. By the time we do, you will have long surpassed us. Because we're exponentially increasing in our technological endeavors. So, to stop you, we are going to kill your science. 
This is the story of the Elohim looking down at the earth and bringing the flood. They say, you've gone too far. You're getting to the point where you can do anything, where you can open the sky, where you can destroy yourselves, where you can come out here within the fractal verse or the heavens and destroy all of it, all of creation. They can't let that happen. We are going to kill your science. They're going to slow our progress. And then this interesting thing happens. She goes into this whole story about something they call a sophon, which is she explains to them there are many dimensions, as I spoke of earlier when referencing the fractal verse, right? There's every dimension being bigger or smaller, basically, right? And if you look at the tiny dimensions, she says they can unfold those tiny dimensions and open them up. So when she unfolds a proton, it actually unfolds to be as big as the sky and it covers the sky. This is symbolically showing you the firmament. And we are underneath it, which means we are in a proton or in a molecular microscopic object. It doesn't seem that way to us because we exist within the mesocosm. We, this is all normal to us. You know what I mean? We just compare, oh, the microphone's smaller than I am, so it's small. No, it's, it's all relative. It all depends on how your perspective is looking at it. But this up here in the movie is a proton. So they're showing you the world exists inside of something that is microscopic, depending on how, what your perspective is, right? And then when that proton folds up on itself, this dome this firmament comes together and then it bows down in the middle, creating this sort of a point up there in the sky. This represents that true form of our firmament or a type of the true, true form of our firmament, not just a contact lens, snow globe dome, but one that goes up and then curves back in at the apex, creating that eye in the sky. So the firmament rolls up, recedes like a scroll, just as it says in prophecy. And then she starts talking to them and she explains their plan to, to keep them from advancing. She says, in place of truth, we give you miracles. You see, there's the balance between truth and miraculous, like we talked about earlier, right? In place of truth, we give you miracles, mysticism. It's a miracle, which means I'm not going to explain it away. I'm not going to research it. I'm not going to uncover it and find out the inner workings of it. I just accept it for being a miracle. We wrap your world in illusions. Now pay close attention to what they show you when they say this. We wrap your world in illusions. And then they, they show you the world. Let me zoom out. Hold on. It's, it's, it's kind of dark, but this is important. Okay. Here are the edges of the quote unquote world. Now, before it, 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 it turns into a ball, this is the fisheye lens effect that they're showing you on the movie. As she says, we wrap your world in illusions. So I'm going to go back and play this step by step. Okay. Um, well, at first, if you were to see this, it was all kind of flat and it looks like a level field or whatever, but she says, we wrap your world in illusions and then she shows you everything has this sort of fisheye lens to it. You see that? That's like the edge of the horizon. But it looks like uh, it looks like a globular world. We wrap your world in illusions, and they show you them bending the world in on itself and making it look like it's a ball or a sphere or a glob. We wrap your world in illusions, and they show you this ball. That just folded in on itself. And then they zoom back into where they were walking, looking at the sky. We make you see what you want, what we want you to see. They're talking about our perspectives. Not like, you know, this microphone. I just, you can see it. You know what I mean? Oh, this, this is an illusion. The aliens possibly made this. No, no, no. It's all about tweaking our perspectives. How we think. How you think affects what you believe to be real and how you interact with the world and what is important and what is not important, what is worth pursuing and what is not. She says, we make you see what we want you to see in order to slow the progress down because we have not earned it. We have not proven ourselves. And then they send out a message. 
all throughout the world. Three words. You are bugs. Insects. You are bugs. Um, things that are creepy crawlies. Tiny. Microscopic. Really, that's what that's saying is that we're tiny. Which was shown to us earlier when that proton unwrapped itself and became the firmament, showing us that we are microscopic. We are the Who's in Whoville. We are bugs. Tiny creatures. And then they zoom up a level. You can see how small the humans get, right? And this, this message is displayed everywhere. You are bugs. You are bugs. Also, you could say that you are what you eat. Right? I was looking in the chat to see if anyone made that connection. You are what you eat. People have started eating insects all, of, all across the world. The governments of the world have totally approved mashing up insects and using that as an approved ingredient in your common foods. Not only that, but many people are infected with worms. Animals, people, all the, the worms are all over the place. Parasites. And if parasites are within most of the humans, then the parasites are what the humans are. The parasites are in control. The parasites are the ones that are running the world. So, it's good, I find, I'll speak for myself, that it's good to run a self-diagnostic and run a cleansing and be careful and recognize the wars that we wage on the inside as well as the outside. But the message is spread everywhere. You are bugs. And then this happens. They, they have that sofon, which is that proton that opens up. It's like a computer. It's like a computer that they've, they've turned a proton into a, com a computer. And then uh, they show you the dome wrapping around the world. And it's reflective. So take a good look at this. They show you our firmament. They show you that it reflects as above, so below, right? So if you imagine that doom shape up in the sky acting as a, a bowl that's reflective because it's made of ice, clear ice, it reflects what is underneath it. It will reflect the Garden of Eden right below it, which means that that circular object up there in the sky, which is a dome, will have an X across it with a circle in the middle. And they show us this in, in the show. They show you a type of this, where they show you this volcano, which this is a type of Mount Maru, and they show you the inverted dome directly above it. And they show you that um, the sky reflects back to us the earth that we live on. And then this happens. They look up in the sky and an eyeball appears, or what looks like an eye appears in the sky. There's no need for them to have a big eyeball up there because these little sophons, when they shrink them back down into the size of like protons, uh, they could basically go anywhere, listen to anything, watch anybody, right? But they're showing you this symbolically, this eye in the sky symbolism. This is the doom shape. This is the apex of our firmament. This is the inverted dome that I was talking to you about, the eye in the sky that people see from time to time, which is an evil eye, which is a portent of doom and destruction and changing and the winking eye and the one eye and all of that. The single eye, the depressurization point. There's like a little eye right there. Um, when it opens, this becomes the mouth of Kronos. When all of that plasma comes seeping out of that circular object, it becomes Medusa's head. I'm so excited. I hope I'm not being too loud. <laughs> um, now, they go back into this laboratory. They're trying to figure out how to beat the aliens. When in reality, all they have to do is fix themselves. You know what I mean? Um, and the apocalypse wouldn't happen. And then the eye in the sky wouldn't open up and the aliens couldn't get in. It's pretty easy. Pretty simple. But they don't know that. Now, this little coffin deal that they're looking at has a monkey inside of it. And they have frozen this monkey and slowed down its metabolism. And they say he's not dead. He's not alive. So this is a... The, because they're trying to beat the aliens, what their plan is, is they're going to send a person or a scouting mission 
to go intercept the aliens, and all of this is ridiculous in my mind because it doesn't make any sense to me, but they're going to shoot a rocket out into space with a person or with somebody and some equipment to go spy on the aliens to figure out how big their force is and stuff like that, right? But it's going to take 400 years to do it, and your average lifespan human will die on the way. So they need to cryogenically freeze them and thaw them out when they get there so that they can, you know not die basically so they're testing this monkey everything's working properly they're able to basically um slow down a person's lifespan allowing them to wake up in the future and to live for hundreds of years essentially and they practice this on this monkey and it works so the monkey gets up he's fine I have not talked about this because I don't like all the drama. I mean, you know, it's not really my thing. But this guy, the other scientist, the teacher, he has cancer and he's going to die. He's been given like six months to live or less or whatever. And he's on his deathbed. This is his deathbed. And he has volunteered and he has been volunteered. Uh, they realize that, that a human body is too heavy to send in this rocket that they want to go send. To have somebody spy on the aliens. So they're going to take somebody's brain, his brain, out of his head. They're going to cryogenically freeze it and then wake it back up. And they're going to hope that the aliens actually reconstruct his body. I don't know. There's it's a lot of leaps at this point in the, in, the, in the production. But anyways, this guy is basically going to donate his brain. Okay. And he's going to put it on the rocket and they're going to blast it off to meet the aliens so that the humans can spy on the aliens. Um, so he has to press a certain buttons if he wants to, you know, finish the job or whatever. And he does. So they show him on a hospital bed, a container that has his brain in it. And they put it into this little cryogenically freezing box or whatever. And then you have the Chinese lady and she goes back to this satellite in China. You can see it's all broken because this is the future now. And She's basically suicidal. She wants to die. And this is also something that I highly recommend you watch out for if you if you believe in following the omens. Many of the omens and prophecies indicate that there will be a lot of people that end their lives before the apocalypse comes. That that'll just be a commonplace thing that people do. And if you pay attention, that's it's already happening. Unfortunately, it's sad, but it, it is happening. So she goes back to this uh, place where it all started. She looks over this cliff. She's basically about to jump off the cliff. And then she sees that girl that told the other girl to go check out the stars and watch them blink. She gave her the decoder at the beginning. And um, she's there to actually kill her, which is crazy. Um, and then we go back to this scene. Aliens declare war, so the whole world knows about this. 400 years from now, the aliens will arrive, and they will take over our world. Um, what else? Oh, then that, that black guy that has the, sun, the, the glasses. Remember that guy? Okay, this is all... It's, it, it really branches out into these different stories, so I'm trying to keep it all together. Um, that guy gets chosen by the government and he's kidnapped by his own government because they insist that he be a part of this program. So they show you him being taken to that plane, the black plane. They put him in this bulletproof clothing to protect him because he's a crucial part. The aliens are interested in him, so so are the humans. So the governments of the world elect him to fly out to New York. He goes to the United Nations and... Um, he has no idea what's happening. He has no idea why he's being kidnapped by the government or anything. And then he listens in on what's being said by the world leaders. And he says that we have elected three different people to come up with a plan to defeat the aliens. These people must keep that plan to themselves because the aliens can see everything in our world, but they cannot read our minds. They cannot read our thoughts because we are not telepathic. So they, we have that going for us. So they choose him to be one of the people who's going to come up with a plan to disable the aliens, basically. She says, uh, we face an enemy that's more powerful than we are. We cannot hide or they cannot read our minds. We have chosen three people to formulate and direct strategic plans, and they will develop these plans entirely in their own minds, sharing them with no one 
until the time is right to execute. We shall call them wall facers. The people who face the wall. The wall, symbolically, of our world is the dome, the firmament, Antarctica, etc. Um, also, people that just meditate. Okay? The people who come up with a plan to defeat the aliens, survivors, basically, are people who meditate, basically. The wall facers never need to explain their actions and their commands. So he's just been given basically absolute power on earth, along with these other two people that they chose. Regardless of how incomprehensible their behaviors might be. So she calls him up. She basically says, you get to do whatever you want on this planet because we've elected you to be one of three people to save us, to save our civilization. As soon as he walks out of the building, he's shot by a sniper. He doesn't die because he's wearing bulletproof clothing, but that's how important it is. Now, I want to get back to more relevant things to our actual history, okay? This is the plan that they have come up with to defeat the aliens or to, to send out. Remember how I said they're going to send out that dude's brain or whatever? In order to, We don't have the technology to send him out at 1% light speed, which is what they need to do in the movie. So follow me for a second. This is very interesting. What they're showing you here on the computer is these little dots. These are nuclear bombs. Their plan, the human's plan, in order to shoot someone out to where the, the alien Santee are, right, and get there quickly, is they need to exponentially hurry that, uh, that pod and rush it through space. So what they're going to do is they're going to explode nuclear bombs in space, one after another, in the hopes that the explosion will propel this capsule that has this sort of uh, parachute on the front of it and the parachute catches all the explosion I guess um, that's none of this really works in in a vacuum of space but let's just pretend right look at the line look at this this exists already in our sky now these in the movie are nuclear bombs that they're going to use in order to fight the aliens plasma that comes into our world. On the next scene or a scene shortly after that, they make a big deal about this fishbowl. And it was a gift that was given to one of the characters. This fishbowl is highly symbolic and directly related to what you see here nuclear bombs that are going to blow up in space or nuclear bombs that we have already detonated in space or in the the space above us and the dome and the dome the firmament okay this is called operation fishbowl there are many secret government operations that have been classified declassified secret top secret etc that have been leaked out and told to the people Operation Fishbowl was when they, the governments shot nuclear bombs 250 miles up, straight up into the air, and exploded them. The dome is much higher than that. 250 miles up is uh, where they say the ISS orbits. Exactly where the ISS orbits, actually. That's interesting. The governments blew up detonated nuclear bombs, many of them, powerful ones, 250 miles up above the land. And they recorded, first and foremost, they created an artificial um, energy band or uh, radioactivity band, radioactive band, basically. Just like how we have the natural Van Allen belts, Okay, we humanity created an artificial band up there in our own our own atmosphere, our own space or whatever you want to call it, a band of radioactivity that nobody can prove is not there today. They, they would try to convince you, oh, it's dissipated. Oh, it's fine. Mm, I don't know about that. But in addition, in project in uh, Operation Fishbowl project, there's other projects that are within this operation, like Project Dominic and others, Starfish, etc. Um, 
They had Project Fishbowl. It's called Fishbowl because it's the dome above us, okay? They were especially interested in the electromagnetic pulse that is created when nuclear bombs go off high up, far away, far enough away to not harm us down here on the surface. But they recorded and they were very interested in the electromagnetic pulse that stretched and reached all the way back down to the ground that was recorded in disrupted electronics in Hawaii. Shooting a string of electro of uh, nuclear bombs. Does this look familiar to anybody? I don't. I don't know if anyone in the chat has said it yet. But this is what our governments have already been planning, have already been practicing, and have already done because they're preparing for the apocalypse. They're preparing to fight the aliens they know if if they know what i know or what i have come across so far okay then they would prepare for it especially if they have family members that are staying behind okay i'm gonna i'm gonna connect the dots quite actually check this out operation fishbowl starfish prime event or um, um, Project Starfish Prime. Uh, they shot a Thor nuclear warhead up into the space. They shot many of them. They recorded the electromagnetic pulses. Dominic, fishbowl, nukes detonated in space. Starlink, satellites, dots going across the sky that they say. The purpose of these things is to provide internet that we already have. Just in case you're out on the ocean, just in case you happen to be super rich and in a luxury cruise liner and you need internet out in the middle of nowhere. Or what about those poor people that live in the desert? We need to give them internet. I'm not buying the official story on Starlink. They have shot over 5,000 satellites up there into the sky that create, every time, a line of lights. Dots up in the sky. Why? If it's not for internet, which I very much doubt, okay? I'm not even going to get into the physics of it's moving and all that stuff and you need to catch up to it with your phone and how much sense it does not make. I'm going to focus on what does make sense to me and what has happened in our recent history and why they continue to poke and prod at the firmament and at the sky above us. And I assume they know what, what I'm discussing and maybe more. So we have Starlink satellites that are being launched to cover the globe, to cover the, the world or whatever, all over the place. Let's just say that the movie and real life are the same. Let's suppose. That means that these are not actually satellites that provide you internet service. But what we're looking at in the movie reflects back to us reality our very real world so the logical question and a reasonable question to ask would be why jay would they sh cover the sky with nuclear bombs well they were studying the electromagnetic pulses to see how far each one would spread out. They put and position each one of these lights or dots up there in a grid pattern so that when that day comes, when plasma comes down into this world, the aliens invading to come down and terraform and the cosmic thunderbolts of the god are coming down and they have used science to try to figure out how to preserve themselves. Just like the alien, just like the Santee in the movie. If you create an electromagnetic pulse, exactly like in the Matrix and the Sentinels, which look like freaking plasma or whatever those things were called, right? Remember those little robot squiddies, right? That's basically plasma, okay? 
symbolically speaking. They used an electromagnetic pulse to disable them because an electromagnetic pulse or a strong blast of magnetism will repel plasma. And if you detonate all of these at the same time above the sky, then any plasma or cosmic thunderbolts that are coming into the earth will be dispelled. They will wrap around and they will go down towards the edges of the world instead of hitting the populated areas. Just an idea. Just a theory. I'll say. Now, we get back to the movie, and on the news, they're talking about the cicadas, which is interesting because we've got this year an omen of all these billions and trillions of cicadas that are supposed to be showing up anytime now, which is a plague of grasshoppers, basically, or a type of grasshopper. And they say the cicadas have returned in record numbers this year. And this movie went into production like three or four years ago. So this is all very interesting that it's all adding up. 2024, this year, you've got these two broods of cicadas that are hatching. Brood number 19, which happens to be the same number as the leaders listed in the Fallen Angels category in the Book of Enoch. And brood number 13, which happens to be the number for the bloodlines that are related to the last survivors and those, the tribes. The, tribe of, the tribes of survivors. There's 13 tribes. Interesting. So, uh, the girl, the killer girl that works for the alien, she goes around basically being their hitman. She comes into her place and she thinks somebody has, that someone's in there. So she pulls out her gun, but it's one of these capsules, one of these boxes. And she gets one of these little VR helmets. And it says, if one of us survives, we all survive. Which is that, um complex spirit hive mind mentality type thing once again so she's excited she puts on her little vr headset and she gets to talk to her bosses her lords the aliens etc which is a frequency it's an energy now keep in mind she's a killer this girl i haven't talked about her much but she is a hitman for the aliens because the aliens can't just come here and just kill people or whatever so they're they're they resonate because they represent plasma that's coming in to kill things, okay? And to change the world and terraform and stuff. That plasma has the ability to resonate right now with individuals that are here in the dome already. Which turn people what I call plasma possessed. Okay? The world's going to become highly psychotic very quickly. Anyways. Now, they show the rocket blasting off with the brain. Right? Remember they froze the brain and they shoot it out and they're going to detonate that string of Starlink freaking satellites up in space or whatever. Uh, they say, approaching the first of our nuclear detonations, the things out there in space, boom, they're blowing up, etc. Uh, long story short, it does not work because the, the parachute breaks or whatever, okay? Anyways, uh, the girl uses the sofon to send a signal into the television in the airplane where the rich guy is. And she says, we're sorry that the staircase project failed. So the staircase is like the stairway to heaven. This is another way of looking at the symbolism there. We would have liked to have meet, met Mr. Downing, which is the guy that had the terminal cancer or whatever, the brain. So he's, his, he's off trajectory. So that frozen brain is like going somewhere else in space now, just floating around. And we hope to meet you if your hibernation technology works. This guy plans on uh, cryogenically freezing himself so that he can wake up in the future and defeat the aliens or whatever. And then um, the detective takes the other two, uh, the black guy with the glasses that he's watching and his friend. They're basically like talking about like, what's the point? You know, we're going to die. They're calling us bugs. And they're right. We're basically inconsequential. So this guy takes them out to like this marsh. And he shows them all of these cicadas that are everywhere, all over the place. And he says, listen, even if we are bugs, look how many there are. You can't kill all of them. They're everywhere. And that's us. There's so many of us. There will be survivors. The bugs get into everything. They get everywhere. And there's humans all over the place. There will be survivors from, from, um, of the apocalypse. And they zoom out and they show you all of the bugs. The cicadas flying everywhere. And they sort of leave a cliffhanger for season two. 
I had a blast watching this. And it's it, this is one of those things that's so deep that I'm just like, like wow, like information download. It's amazing. I'm I'm sure I'm gonna watch it again. I'm definitely gonna watch part two. I hope that you all have enjoyed this presentation. Be sure to go check out some of my other recent videos that I've just put out lately. Um, I'm honored that so many people are becoming members of my channel. Um, I'm getting donations and a lot of support, and a lot of you know likes and stuff. People are sharing my videos. It's humbling and it's an honor to do what I do and, and share my path with all of you. And it's nice to hear that I, I have a positive effect on some people. So... Thank you. Thank you all for being you and uh, coming together. All right. Until next time, I'm Jay Drimmer saying good vibes and goodbye. Oh